Once again, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. What an incredible turnout. Can we start the day with a round of applause for this? <laughs> Willingness, interest, commitment. This truly is inspirational as we go into day two of deliberations at this senior level meeting. Now, um, let me remind you of our social media handles and hashtags. You can follow on Twitter at Dev Corporation, at UNDP Live, and at OECD Dev. The hashtags, ladies and gentlemen, hashtag 2019SLM, hashtag GPECD, DC, DC, I knew I'd do that. GPEDC, <laughs> and we can also hashtag HLPF 2019 as we prepare to go into the high-level meetings as well over this week. So great to see you all. Yesterday, of course, we looked at effectiveness being possibly the missing link to accelerate the implementation of the 2030 agenda. And I think we realized in this room that effective partnerships mean hard work for all of us. Today, we're looking at the how do we do it. It's all about action. And allow me to share an African proverb with you. When the leg does not walk, the stomach does not eat. So action, action, action. We need to get things done. We kick off the day, uh, ladies and gentlemen, with an address from Rebecca Greenspan, General Secretary, Ibero-American General Secretariat. She's the former UNDP Associate Administrator and, ladies and gentlemen, the second Vice President of Costa Rica. Can we give her a warm welcome as she comes up to the podium? Thank you very much. Thank you, Julie. Thank you very much. Thank you all the panelists and, and my friends from so long. It's great to see you. Uh, let me begin by uh, uh, straight to the issue since uh, time is of essence. Uh, let me uh, welcome all the representatives of international development cooperation agencies, trade unions, private sector, colleagues from the UN, multilaterals, uh, dear Thomas, let me begin by saying that indeed, only four years have passed since we adopted the 2030 Agenda. But let's be honest, these four years have felt like, like a decade. We live now in a world substantially different to the one that saw the birth of the Sustainable Development Goals. A world more fractioned and polarized. A world where the utility of multilateral spaces is openly challenged. In this context, the Sustainable Development Goals and the Climate Change Agreement are still the only agendas that pushes us to cooperate at a global scale. And the only positive narrative that remains in a world of often blind and competing ideologies. We therefore face a much more difficult task today than four years ago. The task of regaining the trust of the people and of finding room for positive action in this great and confusing cacophony. But we also face a much deeper inspiring task today than four years ago, the task of showing the world that shared progress is still the right way forward. I would like to focus today on three major challenges we face in this task. One, the challenge of unlocking bottom-up social action, and effective partnerships with civil society, local governments, and the private sector. Two, the challenge of correctly tailoring, monitoring, and implementing SDGs policies at a national level. And three, the challenge of policy coherence, not only at the national level, but between the national and global levels, mitigating negative spillovers from some countries to others. On this point, I will focus mainly on the spillovers from developed to, to developing countries. First, we have the challenge of unlocking bottom-up social action. We all know that unless we internalize the SDGs in the political economy of the countries 
and make it part of the political conversation. There is no sustainability to the transformational long-term efforts that need to be taken. For this to be possible, civil society is the main partner, since governmental authorities will come and go in the next decade. But the strategic vision to achieve the SDGs and the commitment should stay with society as a whole. On the other hand, localizing the SDGs is key because this is the only way to root the SDGs in the people's daily lives. Only in Latin America and the Caribbean, 80% of the population live in cities. The continuum between the rural and the urban areas can only be managed if the local communities and local governments are involved. And finally, with respect to the private sector, the UN calculates the cost of achieving our SDGs at about $30 trillion by 2030. Now, to go from billions to trillions, we know we need effective partnership with the private sector. Indeed, two out of three dollars must come from our companies, and not through corporate social responsibility only, but through new models of doing business that will be able to have as their own objectives, not only the maximization of profits, but also social inclusion through decent work and standards and, and environmental sustainability. This is what we call now the fourth sector, including a wide range of a typology of companies like B Corp, circular economy, social enterprises, triple impact firms, etc. We need a new generation of entrepreneurs, workers and consumers to unlock a double convergence towards social impact in our private sector. From the top down, by encouraging big corporations to become more sustainable. And from the bottom up, by allowing new kinds of companies across our vast geographies to flourish. Companies that already have SDGs in their DNA. Companies that operate in new markets and new places. Companies that work with new people and new ideas. This is perhaps perhaps the challenge where I have become more optimistic through time. Change has already begun. According to the Financial Times, 75% of our millennials' savings are invested in funds that are committed to at least one SDG. One out of every three startups in our social enterprise are of this kind. And there are already over $25 billion invested in social impact funds where the biggest shareholders are private investors, most of them women and young people. That, what this means is that if these entrepreneurship and investing trends continue, a big chunk of our funding needs could be met. But this will not happen by default. We need to partner with them and promote laws for these kind of companies and investors to grow. There will be precisely a report presented on Monday. I invite all of you to look at it about the fourth sector for the SDGs. The second challenge I would like to mention is the challenge of implementing the 2030 agenda at the national level. In rough terms, in order for each country to set in motion the work they need to do to achieve all their SDGs, they must first commit to the 2030 agenda from the highest political office, have a multi-stakeholder agreement in light of SDG 17, from which whole of society efforts can begin, three, allocate part of the central budget to SDG-specific policies, fourth, correctly monitor its effort using all indicators available, and finally, have governance systems that are as holistic and integrated as the goals themselves are. These five steps might, might sound simple, but in reality, they are immensely difficult. I know it from experience. As Secretary General of the Ibero-American Summit, I hosted last, ye last year a summit of heads of state and government from all the 22 countries of our region. There, we renewed our vows to the 2030 Agenda, signing a high political declaration that was built through years of work from the bottom up, including 
uh, commitments from the private sector, from indigenous communities, from local governments, academia, parliamentarians, youth, women. But now we are left with the most difficult part, walking the talk, budgeting, monitoring, reforming our governing structures. What we've discovered, however, is that these are steps that are better taken together by building regional common measurements and indicators, by providing technical policy assistance through South-South and triangular cooperation, and in general, by engaging in diverse forms of peer learning. And lastly, policy coherence. Just a couple of weeks ago, 2019 Sustainable Development Report was published. The report, which tracks the worldwide effort of realizing the 2030 Agenda, is very clear on which are the SDGs we are farthest from, namely those concerned with climate action, sustainable consumption and production, and biodiversity. Very worrying. Now the problem here is very clear. These are SDGs where the behavior of some countries can undermine other countries' efforts to achieve the goals. International demand for palm oil, for example, fuels tropical deforestation. Rising sea levels can directly submerge many countries and coastal communities, as our SEEDS group have been pointing out so clearly. But there are other negative spillovers. Tax havens and illegal flows from developing countries to developed countries is estimated in $1 trillion a year by the Global Financial Integrity Report of 2019, reducing the fiscal space of the poorer countries. Tolerance for poor labor standards in international supply chains harms the working poor in many developing countries because trade barriers take away the income opportunity of millions, and the list goes on. To, be to begin addressing this challenge, we need to acknowledge a fundamental fact of the 2030 Agenda, the fact that it is universal for a reason that it addresses developed and developing countries equally for a reason, because what one hand builds, the other might easily destroy. Because we can only succeed at even the most basic goals of the 2030 Agenda if we cooperate at a global scale, if we keep alive the multilateral framework that sustains it all, if we achieve policy coherence at all levels. Dear friends, these are just some of the most urgent challenges we face, challenges that require action from every person in this room. We need to transit from the what to the how and from implementation to transformational action. We have to work together to devise common strategies, policies, indicators for a successful implementation of the house. We need to partner and include new actors, new investors and new companies into our frameworks of cooperation to go from the billions to the trillions we need. We need to change our models of cooperation and support national efforts in order for each country to set in motion the work they need to do to achieve the SDGs. We need policy coherence at the local, national, regional, and global levels. And this also means a change as well in the way we think about international cooperation, starting by fostering the core values that inspired the 2030 Agenda and moving from the concept of graduation to the concept of gradation so that no country is left out of the debate because of the GDP. The geography and geometry of cooperation have changed. We do not have a simple donor-recipient dynamic anymore or countries that give while others receive. We have countries that do both at the same time, that have established their own cooperation agencies. Therefore, the more active governments are in cooperation initiatives, the faster we will advance on solutions and implementation challenges. And there is where South-South and Triangular Cooperation, which are at the forefront of our Ibero-American cooperation model, play a fundamental role. I am very eager to hear the opinions of the panelists on this matter, as I am sure they have faced these challenges already on their daily work. The world after the 2030 Agenda is completely different to the one we are living today. Behind the SDGs lies a world fully transformed from our own. These transformations 
have already begun, and one of the most important one lies precisely in this chamber, the transformation of our partnerships, of our cooperation and alliances to conquer the long-term goals we all share. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Greenspan. What a refreshing keynote address to kick off our day. Thank you so much for that. A reminder that we must be strategic in our thinking. Progress will not happen by chance. It will happen by design. Asante. Now we move to our first session of the day. We're focusing on effectiveness for sustainable development, exploring challenges and potentials for the future. This session will look at the importance of effectiveness, particularly in view of major global trends that we are seeing in the current environment. And we're asking ourselves what role can the global partnership play? It's my pleasure to hand over to the moderator of that session, Ms. Alyssa Goldberg, Assistant Deputy Minister, Strategic Strategic Policy, Global Affairs, Canada. Over to you, ma'am. Thanks. Uh, merci infiniment. Uh, thank you very much, Julie, and good morning to all. Uh, uh, so first of all, amazing to see all of you here. It's Sunday morning. You're awesome that you agreed to come and have this conversation with us. Uh, and that really speaks, as Julie suggested, to the importance and the significance of the conversation that we want to have. And this session really will be a conversation. Um, so I've been sitting amongst you over the last uh, day and a bit, and I know that you're chomping at the bit. You have all kinds of things that you want to contribute. And so I've warned the panel uh, that I'm determined that this is actually going to be a conversation. So I'm hoping that we'll have at least a half an hour to go back out to the room after the panelists have done some initial reflections. Uh, and so start thinking now about the kinds of things that you want to put on the table. Uh, this session is really an opportunity for some reflection. So yesterday was about learning, it was about knowledge sharing, it was about identifying some of those action opportunities. Today I would like us to use this session to reflect a little bit on the challenges and opportunities that we face with effective development cooperation and really pursuing that in what has become uh, an ever more complex global context. Rebecca spoke to the significance and importance of us being both strategic and inclusive. And so we're going to look uh, on this panel at the big picture in terms of the issues and the trends that are shaping the nature of our development cooperation. And I also would like us to use this session, and so going back out to you in the room, to brainstorm a little bit about where we need to go from here. What does a refreshed uh, GPEDC agenda look like? What do you want out of this? Um, it is such a unique platform where we're all here in this room together as peers from across various constituencies, and so we need to make sure that we're maximizing uh, what we get out of this environment. And I say that because, of course, we're at a moment in time, and I know everybody says this every 15 to 20 years or so, but really, <laughs> we're at this moment in time when it's clear that the international system is under considerable stress. Um, it, and this is posing challenges for all of us. Uh, it's posing challenges for established relationships, approaches, and institutions, which again goes back to Rebecca's point about us rethinking, transforming how we cooperate and the nature of our alliances with one another. But while this, um, while this, I think, presents a number of opportunities for us, um, it presents opportunities in terms of innovations, it presents opportunities in terms of new collaborations, um, the stresses on the system, I think, also present for us some challenges in terms of what do we understand effective development cooperation to really mean. So for example, over the last 36 hours, um, some of the things that I've heard in the various sessions have spoken to the importance of us ensuring that we're adapting the effectiveness agenda so that we're able to adapt to the need to have more complex multi-stakeholder cooperation and engagements. Um, there's an ever-growing number of people that want to be at the table. Uh, so how is it that we're going to grapple with that and make sure that that's delivering impact, which of course is what we're trying to seek at the end of the day. It's not effectiveness for its own sake. It's effectiveness because we're trying to deliver transformational impact so that every, we can achieve growth that works for everyone and in a way that is sustainable. Uh, we're also seeing a movement towards whole of society approaches to tackling our shared challenges. So what does that mean through an effectiveness lens? 
there are rising calls for international assistance accountability by all actors. Um, and guess what? That's going to mean that we need better country-level data on results, uh, and from all of us that are participating uh, as collaborators. We also see an increase in complex transboundary challenges, such as climate change, irregular and forced migration, urbanization, and technological change. And again, what's the effectiveness lens that goes on that? As we're pursuing a climate agenda, how are we talking about the principles that GPEDC has been um, advancing and uh, encouraging over the last several years? This is really going to require innovation and agility, um, and we need to think about what that's going to look like in real time. And yesterday we also talked about the importance of securing um, buy-in. Uh, we talked about political buy-in for governments, but it's not just about political buy-in. It's buy-in across all of those constituencies and stakeholders so that we can demonstrate uh, for governments the domestic benefits of ODA, but also for um, countries that are um, engaged in trying to advance their domestic SDG agendas. So GPEDC, we need to think about this uh, as a family. Um, how are we going to address these trends? Uh, how are we going to make sure that this agenda continues to resonate so that we improve the quality of international assistance? How do we improve the ability for us collectively to achieve results? And there's been a number of really important uh, outcomes so far. So as we think about a refreshed agenda, we also have to think about the journey that we've come on. So since Nairobi, we've seen real progress in a number of areas. We had sessions yesterday on triangular cooperation, for instance, and the voluntary principles that really offer a framework for us to learn from this frontier model of cooperation. We had that great session at the end of the day yesterday around the Kampala principles. How do we deepen partnerships with the private sector so that we can um, help us collectively to do even better as we pioneer a shared way forward with private capital and private sector actors. I think we're also adapting how we assess our effectiveness in fragile and conflict-affected environments um, so that we can be more effective in helping those that are the furthest behind first. So, as we consider these trends uh, and these achievements, I really also want to make sure that we're thinking about the differentiated impact that this has on p multiple kinds of identity that people have, including how gender equality can continue to remain at the forefront of our efforts on effectiveness. There's overwhelming evidence, including evidence that's been shared through UN Women Reports, that shows how gender equality has a multiplier effect for progress against all the SDGs. And so we talk about SDG 5 as the gateway SDG. Uh, we need to think about what that means for the effectiveness agenda as well. So that's more than enough from me. Uh, knowing that my colleagues on the panel are going to have lots of examples to share in their own uh, areas of how they think the development effectiveness agenda can be brought forward, I'm now going to turn it over to them. Um, my hope is that in my colleagues sharing their experiences, they're going to challenge us, as I know that they will, to think beyond business as usual uh, and consider how GPEDC can continue to evolve over the next several years um, so that we can achieve the kind of impact that we're hoping for. So on that note, I am going to start uh, with my good friend, Robert Piper, who I, I think probably has the hardest job, uh, next to maybe the Secretary General, uh, in the UN system, uh, because of course Robert is the Assistant Secretary General uh, at the UN uh, Development Coordination Office. Uh, so he's charged with nothing short of complete and utter cultural and transformational change in how we deliver development assistance within the UN system. So no stress uh, for Robert. Uh, so how are you getting along with that? Uh, how are you driving change? Uh, how are you dealing, how are you making sure that the UN is dealing with a changing development landscape? Robert. Um, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And, uh, uh, and good morning, everyone, Th and Rebecca, so wonderful to hear such inspiring words from, from Rebecca as well. Um, I, I'm doing fine. We're doing fine. I think we're very uh, proud of the progress we've made in, in a relatively short period of time to indeed undertake a, a, a transformation, an institutional and a, and a cultural transformation of, of, the, of the UN development system, how we organize ourselves, um, uh, how we... Uh, 
uh, what incentives we work around, uh, what instruments we use. And of course, ultimately, we've been triggered in this, uh, in this effort by, uh, by the Sustainable Development Goals, which uh, uh, both set the ambitions much higher for us, uh, but also reveal, in a way, um, the inadequacies of our architecture, which are still built in a, in a, in a very kind of sectoral world, when indeed, uh, as you've both mentioned, Rebecca and Alyssa, uh, the demands are much more uh, horizontal in nature. And being driven by member states, secondly, uh, who really have high expectations of the UN to be uh, a trusted partner in this, uh, in this journey. We're very determined uh, to make sure that this big transformation effort uh, uh, produces a number of key results that, that are at the core of our partnership in, in this bigger ecosystem. We want the UN to be, uh, uh, must become a source of very high quality policy advice for member states and for others. High quality integrated policy advice that sticks, uh, that catches up with the type of issues the SDGs have put on the table. We want the UN, through these reforms, uh, 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 to bring a multi-dimensional uh, or multi-sectoral effort to some of the big outstanding programmatic goals that we have had on our agenda for many years, where we see the finish line. Is it eradicating malaria? Is it getting the last 100 million girls into school? What are those last big programmatic uh, uh, um, goals that we have that are a UN that is really tied together across the multi sectoral nature of our, of our family, and it really is a vast family, how can we be a key engine in getting those issues across the line? We want these reforms to deliver better cross-border and sub-regional responses, both for the opportunities out there that the SDGs have flagged around water and energy, but for the risks uh, that we've also seen around conflict and, uh, and other issues. We want these reforms uh, uh, to make sure we deliver a UN that is m much more effective at supporting all of you uh, in the convening work that needs to be done, in the convening work of bringing together uh, uh, civil society and governments, but of course also that financing ecosystem that we're so focused on now as we talk about billions to trillions. And finally, I would underline, um, we want these reforms uh, to make sure that in doing so, we protect the gains that we have made so far in these decades of development efforts, that prevention, that risk mitigation uh, uh, remain absolutely power, pa paramount. How are we doing this? We're doing this through a very different leadership model, uh, both at the country and global uh, level, through resident coordinators that are full-time and staffed with, uh, with the kinds of assets required to really focus on strategy, coordination, convening, outreach, advocacy. We're doing it through new planning and financing instruments uh, that bring us together across the UN's fairly outdated, frankly, mandates in terms of our, uh, the way we have been structured. Uh, we're doing it through uh, a bigger push on transparency and accountability, better quality reporting uh, uh, to member states and to, to donors and to others so that you are clearer about what, what, what we've achieved, where we've, uh, where we've uh, struck uh, obstacles and why. Um, we're doing it through a much stronger effort at, at, at efficiencies, both in terms of pooling our assets whether it's from uh, advisory services and having a much better idea of where that knowledge and expertise is in across the 90,000 people that work in the UN's development efforts across 165 countries and territories. So better efficiency in knowing, uh, in pooling those resources to know where the advice can best be tapped, uh, uh, but also efficiency in the sense of being a lot more modest about our comparative advantage and recognizing that some people are much better than us at doing certain parts of this development effort and the UN needs to stick to what it's good at and partner uh, with others on those that it's not as good at. And I think this is a kind of key theme uh, that runs through all of our reforms. I think uh, uh, to be very brief and to just finish on some of the offerings, I think that this, uh, these reforms uh, uh, are are suggesting for this partnership work around development effectiveness and development cooperation. Um, we, we do believe a more streamlined, more coherent UN with a single development strategy uh, in the, in, for each country that brings together all the different parts of the UN system, both locally who are resident, but also that huge ecosystem of UN agencies that aren't necessarily physically present, but have a huge amount to offer is good for everyone. First and foremost, it's good for governments and it's good for 
for I think all actors that are working on, on uh, this development work. Um, we think uh, uh, this offers also uh, our investment in 131 RC offices around the world, uh, provides a sort of one-stop shop, particularly for new partners to the UN that have not yet found its home and need a, a kind of a, a, a predictable entryway to start a conversation at the national level or for that matter at the global level uh, uh, when you're trying to find that partnership uh, and to settle where, where the expertise best complements what you have to offer. Uh, uh, I think that is key. We are putting five professionals into every RC office around the globe. Typically today you'll have one RC office with one or two national staff and another one with maybe 20 or 25 staff. We want to make sure that in every location, every resident coordinator can offer a core set of predictable services to government, to agencies, to de development partners, to civil society and beyond. Um, third, um, we think these reforms in terms of partnership will offer you a much more accessible resident coordinator released of other responsibilities so that they can focus on strategy, they can focus on constituency building, uh, they can focus on, 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 on reports, uh, results reporting, uh, they can focus on more coherent fundraising for the system so that we aren't competitive but rather coming together as a family. Uh, I think that's good news for everyone. Um, and I think finally uh, I would, I would uh, underline that this, these reforms uh, in terms of partnership um, uh, are a, a, a big push in, in, in bringing together these coalitions uh, uh, to support governments on this SDG journey. Uh, at the core of this new vision of a UN development system led by a resident coordinator is a clear demarcation between the operational work of the UN system and the leadership work of a, of a resident coordinator that is not operational, uh, that is focused on strategy, on, on bringing together the policy actors, uh, on fundraising, on coalition building around these very multi-sectoral issues that the Sustainable Development Goals have, have put on our table. So maybe I'll, I'll stop there and we'll take it from there. Thank you. It's perfect. Thanks very much, Robert. Um, yeah, you can give him a hand. <laughs> he needs all the love and support you can give him. <laughs> So Robert talked about uh, can we make sure that the UN is fit for purpose uh, so that it is helping us to achieve our collective goals on the SDGs um, and also making sure that it speaks to its value proposition, um, not least as a coalition builder, for instance. And that's an interesting segue, I think, um, to Anthea, who as the Director for International Development Cooperation at Asia Foundation has been thinking about um, how do we bring uh, all these different uh, uh, actors um, around the same ideas uh, or complementary ideas around effectiveness. And so we talk about southern providers as opposed to emerging donors or emerging actors. And I like that term. It was one that Noel, our Mexican colleague, put on the table this morning. And I think that's a much more fitting use of terminology because it also implies that uh, those that are coming to the fore now aren't necessarily going to look uh, and give the way that we have traditionally given in the past or engaged in the past. And I guess that's my question for you is as these southern providers are starting um, more and more to emerge they're using different frameworks and philosophies how do you see that effectiveness agenda being driven forward with them thanks very much Alyssa uh, I'm gonna speak from the Asian perspective because I work for the Asia Foundation so I'll talk mostly in the context of Asia and predominantly I'm gonna talk about China since we haven't really talked very much about China over the past day so far. So the, the contemporary narrative and practice of development cooperation is being shaped by southern providers, uh, particularly by rising Asia and Asian-led South-South cooperation, as you just mentioned. And China is really at the forefront of this evolution in the narrative and the discourse. And there is an apparent normative shift um, as part of this. And while it is possibly challenging, it really does also offer many opportunities for collaboration and cooperation with other partners. What we're seeing today is that development is being much more explicitly driven by foreign policy. And this narrative is coming as much from the, the DAC community, the DAC countries, as it is from China. 
China and India, for example, have never really made a distinction between development and foreign policy. It's really been part of a model of foreign policy where development was a core element. But Western countries previously tried to sanctify aid. Uh, but this is really changing over time, and, and we're seeing that those days are, are, are really over. China's narrative is, at present, is really articulated through the Belt and Road Initiative. Now, China has been building stuff and training people all over the world for decades. But until the, the BRI, the dots weren't explicitly connected. And it's the scale and the connectivity um, of the BRI make it visionary and potentially transformational for, for the world. But also, it's threatening. Uh, to some, uh, geopolitically, uh, especially when China's relations already are quite strained with countries like the U.S., Canada, Australia. They're tense due to various trade wars, accusations of spying, arrests, cybersecurity, the list goes on. And what, as a result of this, the dominant foreign policy narrative that's coming out of many DAC countries is around containing China, creating a rules-based order. And this is affecting and shaping the development discourse, which is also adopting more security-based language. So we read about coercive capital, sharp power, and containment. So it reads a little bit like this when it comes to the BRI. So the BRI is an imperialist Chinese strategy where Beijing's primary goal is to accumulate political and economic leverage created by Chinese-funded projects. And while China is accruing these benefits, it's also um, creating unsustainable debt in partner countries, it's fueling corruption and threatening democracy. This is not an uncommon narrative right now, and, but this narrative is, it's hawkish, it's hostile, it's competitive, and it's increasingly drowning out more moderate narratives that are out there. So given that backdrop, where can we find space uh, within this adversarial kind of context or narrative for more collaborative development and effective resource allocation? So there's a variety of responses. What we're seeing right now is a trend in what I call throwing more hats into the infrastructure ring. Um, and that's, that's a current trend. So infrastructure is definitely back in vogue for many providers and traditional donors. We see many more inf uh, connectivity schemes on the horizon. So we have the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor, we have the Australian Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific, Japan's Partnership for Quality Infrastructure, the US Build Act, the US Infrastructure Transition and Assistance Network. On the positive side, we've heard many times uh, yesterday and today that there is a huge infrastructure gap globally, so these resources are very well needed. The worry is, however, that the motivation behind some of these newer infrastructure initiatives is to contain and counter China's increasing footprint, rather than to really respond to the needs of the countries or the regions. Um, yesterday we heard from uh, Honorable Delegate from Samoa. And the, the Pacific Islands are a classic case where the Pacific Islands now have a choice of suitors, um, which they didn't have before, and has have often been really a neglected region. A second approach is also to engage China much more multilaterally. Uh, the China, it, China is active in the UN and has always repeatedly expressed its solidarity with other world leaders in support for multilateralism and for the UN. China and India, for example, are leading contributors to the UN general budget and they champion many agendas around the SDG agenda. So there's definitely scope for working collaboratively with China on that kind of flat platform. In, in terms of development finance, uh, in terms of multilateral finance in particular, the AIB has become a vehicle for increased collaboration amongst organizations that were previously unlike-minded. And you see now the ADB and the World Bank collaborating with the AIB on standards and safeguards, which is really important. And where we can push that a little further is to start to look at the issue of debt sustainability. And China can work in partnership with other MDBs to agree on a set of leading and lending standards that will apply to all BRI projects regardless of lender. So that would then apply to organizations like the China Development Bank or the China Exim Bank. We're not there yet, but that dialogue is really important and it can move in that direction. The G20, of course, is another platform where China, when China was the chair uh, in 2016, they were critical in uh, adopting the action plan on the 2030 agenda. 
There are also Southern-led platforms that provide an opportunity for all types of partners to come together. Uh, the Delhi process, which I think there was a flyer going around by RIS India, uh, convenes an annual dialogue that on South-South cooperation. Many people at here attend that dialogue, but it would be great to have more participation from DAC countries. And it's a wonderful meeting of discourse and practice on South-South cooperation. Uh, Sachin is here, please talk to him. Also during the, the Delhi 4 process, we always, ha always have a convening of the Network of Southern think, think Tanks, which is another kind of multilateral platform for think tanks on South-South cooperation. A third area is to look at regional architecture and support for regional architecture. So ASEAN, for example, has not traditionally played a major role in development assistance. However, this increasing geopolitical competition in Southeast Asia and the expansion of large regional development initiatives is prompting new thinking about ASEAN's role in development. Uh, the Asia Foundation has been working on this in particular to look at strengthening ASEAN regional architecture and in that way will allow smaller states to shape the terms of engagement with external actors uh, around development finance, around infrastructure and connectivity. A fourth area is triangular cooperation. We talked a lot about triangular cooperation yesterday and there's been some excellent guidelines that have come out. Um, it's, it's making a comeback for sure and it's more like multinodal cooperation these days. And there have been some very successful examples of working with China uh, around triangular cooperation. Uh, Canada, Australia recently had a, a big hit uh, in Papua New Guinea around malaria. And the last issue I would look at is around sharing institutional architecture. Uh, China has recently established its own development cooperation agency called SIDCA. And SIDCA very much wants to learn from the experiences of other development agencies, both from traditional DAC donors as well as from other rising providers. So there are several ways and means to engage China on a, on a variety of levels that help to sort of promote additional forms of cooperation and collaboration. Thanks, uh, Anthea. I think very interesting, very provocative. I think there'll be, there'll be lots of questions for you uh, when we open up the floor. Uh, when we talk about the, the rules-based international system, we talk about shared rules of the game. And I think one of the things when we come back to the conversation, and this is something that Susanna uh, put on the table uh, earlier, is accountability, shared accountability. It can't be that uh, one set of countries are being held to account, let's say, for example, through peer reviews, but that that's not happening across the board. So that's the one piece that I would come back mm -hmm. to you on is you've talked about engagement and cooperation, but it still doesn't speak to accountability and measurement of impact and, and results on the ground. Mm -hmm. Which leads me to Angela. Uh, Angela uh, is Director General for Colombia's Presidential Agency for International Cooperation. Standing up an entity uh, is uh, daunting, uh, but important. It gives you the opportunity to leapfrog uh, a lot of the learnings that have happened over the last couple of years. It's happening in parallel to some of the things that uh, Anthina was just talking about. So can you share your perspective with the room about the challenges and opportunities that you see from your perspective in delivering results as this entity is standing itself up uh, in order to enhance the SDGs. Good morning to everybody. Good morning to Rebecca and to all the uh, companions that I have at this table. I will address in Spanish. To answer the question, on the performance of the Presidential Agency for Cooperation, I wanted to share with you that Colombia has several institutions for the past 50 years in the area of cooperation. The Presidential Agency for Cooperation in Colombia has established, uh, was established 10 years ago. And this is a way to address the new trans transformational uh, agenda for cooperation. This cooperation agency and the fact that it's linked to the presidency of the republic, this generates a great impact towards the commitment of the Colombian government with a cooperation development. This commitment places us today at this juncture uh, uh, as a country that's a dual country. In that regard, the cooperation agency has uh, the task of managing, articulating, and coordinating cooperation that's 
and Technical Cooperation for Colombia. These years of uh, arduous work has, uh, have allowed us to identify strengths and challenges in multiple areas, including the challenge of uh, integrating the 2030 agenda. Usually in this uh, forum we talked about challenges as things to do, but at this point I wanted to share that in Colombia we have a clear guideline as to how to progress towards the global goal of leaving no one behind. Firstly, I wanted to tell you that we have a national plan for 2018-2020 that's called Pact for Colombia and for Equality. It is a development plan, a second generation development plan for the SDGs. 92% of the targets in the development plan are aligned with the uh, SDGs and their achievement. In that framework, we seek that all of these actions towards development must respond to the achievement of the SDGs and not, not only align certain goals after the fact of uh, approving some of these projects. Very specifically, the question on the challenges and opportunities to bring these results to the ground, to the field on the SDGs. Under this framework, what do we do? We would like to share our uh, roadmap. We carry out key work to enhance coordination. This is the most important access with uh, cooperation workers, with governments, with local governments, with the private sector, and with the civil society organizations, and among them so that their support always complements the important efforts uh, carried out by the government and the national priorities for development. What are the key four key points? We need timely and detailed information in order to avoid the duplicity of efforts, and this should be based on evidence. And also when we negotiate with the, our partners, always with the goal of maintaining cooperation as a tool that complements these initiatives and the national capacities. The APC Colombia, at APC Colombia, we have an information system to track all cooperation actions internationally. These systems has still aspects to be improved. We want to become interconnected with other information systems, including within my country with information systems for planning or statistical information systems, but especially with information systems of the UN agencies in the country. This key is issue for uh, accountability. Secondly, we need to maintain a constant dialogue between nations and, and territories. This is fundamental, it's crucial. At this point, we are creating by law of a national system of cooperation. I wanted to emphasize this law because this national development plan is presented to the parliament that has to be passed in the, uh, by the Colombian parliament. So the Colombian parliament approved this national plan for cooperation. This enables coordination among the different stakeholders. We also have a national strategy for cooperation, which includes the principles of the 2030 agenda and also the principles of the global partnership so th we can achieve this effectiveness. This strategy was not built from the top down, but rather it was built through discussion with local government and local stakeholders. At the end of, at the, end of the day, this cooperation has to have an impact on the ground. 
with the local communities. We have worked with the private sector also. We have an association of uh, business, uh, as, uh, business partnerships that have helped us towards this co coordination. And we have also worked with civil society. Colombia as a dual country, all this information and knowledge not, uh, sharing through triangular and south-south cooperation, all this knowledge sharing that we do as part of our cooperation is closely linked to the idea of co-responsibility when it comes to development. Yesterday, it struck me that the representative of the Islamic Development Bank was criticizing this transfer of good practices. I support this, and I think it's really important to transfer and share these good practices among peers in the Global South. In terms of technical exchanges, we identify and we document good practices. This is not just an improvised exercise. We have a portfolio of good practices that have been identified, systematized, and we can guarantee their efficiency when it comes to supporting SD the SDGs. We want to seek these strategies to enhance the sustainability of the uh, sustainability of international cooperation within the countries. APC Colombia has its own resources to uh, enhance this leverage of the cooperation to generate impact and build capacity among national stakeholders. APC Colombia has driven a cold call initiative which is uh, mimics the South-South uh, cooperation where we can highlight our achievements. So this is the opportunity that we have to seize all the stakeholders that we so we can work jointly. It's not about a bottom-up or a top-down strategy. This is um, the time so we're all aligned, so we all work jointly to achieve a common goal. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Angela. In particular, I like, I really love the idea, actually, of this idea of co-responsabilization, uh, which, again, mm -hmm. I think harkens back to what uh, Anthea was talking about and also Robert uh, in terms of that fit for purpose idea is where are we all fitting in within the system so that we maximize. We have too few resources collectively not to be able to make sure that we are driving forward in the, the same direction. And also your idea of reminding us whom cooperation is meant to serve at the end, right? So the involvement of local communities, uh, local stakeholders, uh, and um, local uh, orders of government as well. So that is, je crois, uh, si vous êtes d'accord. And I think that is, uh, if you agree with me, a very good uh, transition. And uh, to my colleague Adama, to my colleague Adama, to Adama, you represent uh, governments um, you, uh, at the departmental level in Senegal. So based on your experience, uh, do you have uh, some advices uh, to give us on the issue issue of uh, the involvement and uh, in a more interesting way, more inclusive, uh, more uh, innovative um, to get the, all the stakeholders more involved uh, and how all those uh, uh, stakeholders um, on the local and the subnational level could be uh, working better together. Thank you. Uh, greetings to all. I just would like to remind you that in theory the issue of uh, development um, uh, of cooperation um, you know uh, is uh, most important for the regions you know and the actors that are in charge of uh, managing uh, the regions and the territories uh, no matter uh, the uh, 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 development action that we lead you know, it's not possible only if we uh, answer the uh, concerns of the population to the the purposes of the territories and the region to the we answer their specificities and their issues their region. if we agree on that point, um, then the issue of cooperation in the area of development uh, 
uh, should be anchored uh, on the concerns of the people. It should be rooted there. And th to that end, we have uh, the agenda, the uh, SGGs uh, that give us a roadmap and give us some, um, you know, instructions in sort of way. In Senegal, in particular, the government has uh, implemented, you know, has implemented the emerging Senegal plan, which gives us some ideas. Anything we do on the local level is articulated with these national plans so that we have global coherence for the entire uh, apparatus of fundings and, um, and all the system. That is why, to answer very specifically your question, um, the first advice I can give you is that cooperation must be based on the concerns and the needs of the people and not anywhere else. We have uh, many partners that come in and they come with their own ideas. Um, Let's make sure that the ideas and that the project are articulated and based and fit to a need, fill the needs of the people. The second requirement that is really important, we need to talk between the regions. In other words, when you go in a, a re local place, say, let's talk to the people, with the communities and the people that have been elected. That allows to it will allow you to go faster, to not waste time, and to be uh, uh, work and piggyback on the local plans. Uh, you know, for the community in that plans, you know, everything is specified, and the plan can be flexible. It can change. It can be you know uh, adapted depending on the moment, depending on the uh, uh, funding plans. But first, let's look at the local plan that has been designed by the region, and in such plans, they've indicated what should be the source of Foundings. Uh, that's the entry point uh, through the local government. Uh, that's key. You, you, you're not going to waste time. You will, in fact, save time. You will go faster because our communities are in a hurry, fighting against poverty. Uh, uh, you know the uh, fight. You know the radicalism in the regions. Uh, the issue of urbanization. Uh, we have many issues. We have uh, floodings. Uh, all of those big issues, they are mentioned in the uh, regional plans. Second key point, um, and on which I would like to insist, uh, is the fact that we should be looking, seeking funding. We l use fund uh, partnerships and uh, to mobilize resources, you know, and uh, I, I agree with that. Yeah, but it should be a win-win type of cooperation. Everybody should be a winner because if we do it uh, uh, that way, everybody will succeed. And that shows you naturally that the I issue of uh, accountability is key, transparency is key, and it's useful in our point of view because the investment that we make, they must go where they are needed. And that's only possible if you listen to the people on the ground, if you listen to uh, local governments and communities who are elected. They have a mandate. They've been you know, elected. They have things that have been that they have to do. That's key. That's the second point, that the, the, the partnership must be a win to be a win win. You know, it should be uh, piggybacking you know, the local plans. Um, uh, I will go faster. Yeah. Second uh, other issue that is important is uh, the uh, involvement of the communities. Uh, let, just, let me give you just one example. Uh, the climate issues. You know, we have uh, wildfires. We have uh, floodings. You know, this is not uh, from the right or from the left. There's no political, uh, you know, colleague. You know, there's no borders. You know, we, uh, you know, when we work with the in international community, uh, it's important because the climate issues of, uh, uh, you know, a threat for the entire world and the life of. People are threatened. Let's work with local government, uh, with the local private sector, with the international community. Let's all work together on a single mobilization plan to fight together against these negative uh, issues that annihilate, you know, the efforts we do in the area of agriculture, in the fisheries, and in other areas of our economy. That we believe is also very important. Mobilizing, lobbying, partnershiping. On uh, on the uh, for a global solidarity, you know that's that's what we need to do because the community is the emanation of the people. If the if the local government you know talks to the people, we you'll be heard. But we don't always have all the resources. In I would like to add one more thing, and I'm kind of talking to myself here in a way. You know, and partnership is an opportunity. I agree. And it's key. And I congratulate all the partners that have worked with us in Senegal in a massive way. But we also must know that these are just means to an end. The partner 
most uh, find me at work when they come in and 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 uh, help me to go further in what I'm doing. That I say, you know, uh, to myself in a way, because as we say in my country, you if you want to help somebody, you have to do it on the ground, and you have to find them on the ground. That will be easier. Lastly, the territorial approach in the area of development is the solution. When we have an active mobilization of the partners, uh, an active mobilization of the communities, uh, we uh, succeed. Uh, they were allowed to go fast and to go fast. Uh, you know, they were allowed to uh, solve the solution of uh, poverty. And, uh, and I could mention many examples here, but unfortunately, we won't have time. The uh, communication also, what I've just uh, read from, is available. It's about 10 pages. I just summarized it uh, for you in front, uh, lady, to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that we are very honored uh, that the, uh, the sustainable development I issue of uh, citizenry in Africa is a key issue in Africa that must be addressed so that we solve the issue of development, so that we don't suffer Further, because our communities are waiting uh, are, uh, and waiting for us. You know, we also that's also part of the uh, uh, that's also necessary for uh, effectiveness of cooperation. If we don't go through the people, uh, you will end up in the wrong place. You're not going on the right road, and the, we need to realize uh, that. And we are accountable. We need to, uh, you know, um, report to people who give us money. And the people are listening to us. You know, our forests, our, uh, uh, you know, waters need to be preserved also and protected. This is what I would like to tell you. That I thank you very much for your attention. I will be answering your uh, uh, questions. We have done some work, and we can share our experience further if you'd like. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Merci, uh, merci infiniment. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor. I think you've uh, presented here at least seven or eight uh, things that we should uh, listen uh, to and that we should take into consideration as we talk about the role of, uh, you know, uh, uh, how you know to work through by going through and working through the population and the local government. I understand that you've said that you know the issue of transparency is key, and transparency is a mean, uh, to, is a way to find win-win uh, solutions. Uh, that's what I noted. It was a key point in your presentation and this issue that we have uh, now right in front of us. So. Now, the floor, as promised, we have a good 20 to 25 minutes for us to have a conversation in the room. Uh, so far, I think our conversation has come together around a number of uh, joint themes around whether or not our approach to uh, effectiveness is fit for purpose, whether or not uh, we're each working in our different ways towards a shared value proposition. We've talked about leveraging multiple forums for dialogue, particularly with um, new partners that are coming forward. We've talked about local collaboration as the driving action. Uh, co-responsibilization and transparency uh, as being critical as we think to what the future agenda looks like for GPEDC. And so with that, I'm going to open it up. So signal uh, with your placard uh, if you'd like to take the floor. I'd ask you to introduce yourself and be super brief so that we get the maximum number of uh, colleagues that want to take the floor. And I'm warning Hirad Sabadi if you're here. Hirad, I'm planning to call on you. We, our colleague from uh, the Islamic Development Bank. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for all the panelists, very powerful presentations. I took the floor really because I need to uh, clarify what the respected lady just mentioned about the Islamic Development Bank, and I wish I knew Spanish. I would have said it in Spanish just to make it very clear and vivid. I thought I understood that the Islamic Development Bank is not uh, encouraging sharing information. This is what I got into the translation. Uh, unfortunately, this is not the case here. We're talking about the South-South organization that has 57 member countries. And during my presentation uh, yesterday, I was talking about the importance of triangular co co uh, cooperation and South-South cooperation, but at the same time, I was emphasizing, and I think this is the echo in the room yesterday and today, and the principles echo that also. I think the time for giving prescriptions from the north to the south need to stop. I think in a way by adaptive leadership we need to give the work back to the beneficiaries and this is meaning 
building the capacity of people in the South to identify problems. The North could really bring a lot of success, successful stories to help guide managing these projects. But at the same time, you cannot come in with ready prescriptions because it succeeded somewhere else. This is the fallacy of best practice. If it worked somewhere else, in some other country, in some other problem, it might be good guidelines, but we need to build the capacity of the locals. I, I, I heard the Germany representative yesterday saying, what if the locals are saying, let's build something, uh, let's build a road to the, to, to the village of that president or that minister? Yes, I agree, there should be some, 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 some checks and balances, but please, uh, the, the idea of ready prescription will not render sustainable development outcomes. And this is the position of the Islamic Development Bank after 40 years of engaging in South-South and committed partner for the triangular cooperation. I hope I'm clear, yep. and I promise you I will start learning Spanish. <laughs> Have a great day. Fantastic. Uh, so thank you. And I think that was the point that you made on the panel yesterday was that we need to talk about um, shared knowledge and learning uh, and uh, your discomfort with the concept of uh, the fallacy of best practice as such. Uh, but I think the point is also about shared accountability. Uh, and so with that, I saw a young woman at the one to second tier in the back. So yep, ma'am, go ahead. Um, I'm Una Hombrecher from Swiss Church Aid, a member of Act Alliance, and I have been uh, very much inspired about uh, uh, the analysis of the um, development discourse, which is changing. And I think it's a very important point because we have been discussing the civil society space a lot yesterday, and I think this is a, a clear link between uh, the changing narrative of what development is and the changing civil society space. So if you look at um, maybe organizations which would work on uh, goal 8.1 on growth, for them space is not actually shrinking, but if you're working on goal 16, or if you have inclusiveness or environment in uh, your spirit, then it is closing. So I think what is important, you know, when we look at the discourse, that we look at what the current narrative is of uh, development, and this is a finding of our report, which has been quoted also yesterday, that um, it's mainly a new discourse where those organizations working on uh, human rights or, or um, environmental justice, that those are um, at stake and uh, they have the problem. So we have to, and I agree, we have to look at how we can get other actors on board, not to have a divide amongst, against, you know, uh, countries like China and the like, it's not only China, it's more. So we have to, to have a clear counter narrative on if we want to have, to achieve the sustainable development goals, we have to include civil society and human rights and uh, to, to come to a common consensus. Thank you. There was a, yep, go ahead, with the paper. Alliance. Oh, th thank you, Madam, Ch uh, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for the panelists today. My name is Bok Jung at Ken University in the United States. I would like to thank you all panelists yesterday and today and bringing very comprehensive framework and actually bring to the result and today to the action. And actually, I, I would like to echo uh, one of the session from yesterday. Actually, they, one session mentioned actually inclusive partnership and development. And actually, the, for example, the, the DAC uh, chair, uh, Sujana Burhat, actually mentioned that including OECD and UNDP, of course, they're actually ge gearing toward more inclusive partnership. Actually, also mentioned this morning, so actually I'm echoing in terms of more em emphasis emphasizing the inclusive development. Actually, one of point three, the sub-components actually reconfirmed today's session. First one is actually the civil society organization actually there own actually right and their contribution should continue actually maintain actually more uh, enhanced. That's the first one. The second one you mentioned by a panelist today is actually the local government and local community. And because the gap between those uh, higher level, those UN actually international organization and development partners, actually they don't have any actually the tool actually reaching out to the local community. So we should res respect their voice in their own uh, uh, actually approaches. The third one is actually gender equality. 
because uh, when, I, when I did with the field work with my students in, in South Africa and Zambia and Uganda, and I looked at a lot of very small nonprofit and also social enterprises led by women, it's very the voluntary, uh, the grassroots organization. We should really see how those women in local community, they bring actually change without actually even connection with the government. So actually, we actually, I did three points actually, actually emphasizing the very importance, the importance of actually inclusive development. Thank you very much. Thank you. So colleagues, uh, if we can focus on what are the key issues that you want to make sure on the agenda going forward, that'd be fantastic. So there's a woman that is one, two, three, fourth up holding the piece of paper. Yeah, please. I will speak in Spanish. I am from the AZ Act Alliance. And I, considering that there was a UN delegation recently which expressed its concern by the uh, homicides of ex-combatant, 136 since the signing of the peace agreements was done. My question is, how do you guarantee? How do you... Uh, make sure that the, you do not re have this reduced space and how is the international cooperation strategy, how is that included with uh, uh, local authorities if they are basically absent in those territories where people are being murdered and there's all this uh, big threat and it's uh, kind of going back on the peace agreements. Thank you. Mexico. Muy buenos días. Good morning. Can you hear me? Ignacio Benjamin campos I am a federal rep uh, parliamentarian. Uh, your interventions were quite interesting. I'd like to tell you that the government of Mexico, in fact, is working on accountability and transparency by, its, by itself, which has generated trust by investors and also an I'm particularly interested in the participation of citizens which should promote we should promote in order to really uh, have transformation. Let me add two other elements to development and production factors that we discussed earlier which is land capital and work. Currently our organization is part of this uh, and also we talked about the generation of new knowledge. We have to establish this new knowledge so we have true cooperation. I'm certain that only in this way we will be able to achieve these changes to have a fairer society. I'd like to conclude with a slogan that we should all heed. We have to have economic efficiency with equality and social justice. There is the uh, new legislation of Mexico, which is the legislature uh, of gender parity. We have more women parliamentarians than men. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Uh, we've got uh, an ever-growing list. So I have our colleague down here. I just can't see what it is, CPPS. Um, yep. Sir, and then I've got the uh, orange piece of paper that's flowing. <laughs> then Barry, I see you, uh, and then the gentleman in front of me. Merci, Madame la Moderatrice. Thank you, ma Madame Moderator. I represent the c uh, civil society in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, and I'm uh, asking a question to the representative of Senegal. He said, "If you uh, to to be able to help someone, you have to find him on the way." But before uh, international assistance arrives, it is necessary that the local communities uh, be active. And you uh, uh, mentioned a number of uh, challenges. Uh, and based on your uh, experience, how did you get organized to uh, confront the problems you mentioned before uh, foreign assistance comes to help you? Thank you with the orange piece of paper that was floating before. Yep. No, right in the front. Si. Uh, from uh, Nigeria. Uh, so can you hang on one second? I had the person in the front, and I'll come back to you. Sir, in the front. Go ahead. Nope, not you either. <laughs> <laughs> I swear we'll get to it. Pink shirt, is it 
No, it's next to the pink shirt. There you go. Perfect. Sí, se escucha. Can you now hear me? Can you hear me? Good morning, Inya Walbi Suris. I'm from the Mondragon Company. First of all, thank you very much for facilitating this uh, dialogue. We've been listening for. Uh, to how important it is to have this new model for uh, companies. And we've been talking about cooperation. Let me tell you, there is a um, model of a company that will have a strategy of cooperation, which are the cooperatives. I'm glad you talked about Colombia. And that was a very good example of triangular cooperation. Our project has funds from the government of Spain and the European community. And in fact, we set up cooperatives so that former FARC members can have can make a living. The setup for the company is completely linked to communities. It has been invented, and it's called cooperatives. We believe cooperatives are much closer to the uh, SDGs. Also, I'd like to ask a question. Our goals, we set up all these goals for ourselves uh, in Agenda 2030. If we were having this meeting in July 2030, I and if I asked you then, in summary, what uh, have you done? What would you like to say you've actually been able to achieve? Thank you so much. Okay, great. So we have just five minutes left. So I'd ask that those of you who are going to take the floor be super precise in what it is that you want to raise. So there was the colleague from Nigeria, then Barry, then the gentleman that was right in front of me. That lady at the back that keeps waving. Sorry, what? And the lady at the back that keeps waving. Yeah, okay. <laughs> You'll be our last one. So, sir, our gentleman from Nigeria, yes. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, mine is uh, just to suggest uh, what we actually bring improvement into development cooperation effectiveness uh, going forward. I observe that we have challenge of data. I mean, we need to work on how we are going to improve data on development effectiveness, particularly with the I mean uh, issue of the private sector, the trade union the Sasat cooperation, a lot of uh, emerging issues require information, especially on government side. For Nigeria, the government of Nigeria, the coordination of the development partnership in Nigeria, we hardly get sufficient data to actually, I mean, to, to speak to volume of support that is actually coming from uh, development cooperation and it's difficult for us to measure this effectiveness and it's also affecting the participation of the private sector and even the civil societies. Particularly, we observed that in the last uh, month round, uh, none of UN agencies reported in Nigeria. You, you, I mean, you can imagine if uh, GPDC is organizing this kind of forum and we are going to discuss it, we observe that we don't have information on the cooperation between some of these uh, partners, either the multilateral and bilateral, and this is giving us concern. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Barry. Much, uh, Alyssa. Um, I'm here wearing uh, two hats, uh, that of uh, United Cities and Local Governments, which uh, brings the local government voice to the GPDC Steering Committee, and also that of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, which, as you know, partners with the Canadian government in terms of uh, delivering uh, aid uh, at uh, the local government level in countries. And I really want to emphasize the importance of the role that local government uh, must play in implementing the effective development cooperation, both from a policy development point of view, but also in terms of the real work being done on the ground uh, in cities and communities. I'm sitting beside uh, my friends from the Netherlands and their local government association, VNG. In fact, some of our first work together was post-tsunami uh, in Sri Lanka, where we realized we were both doing work on behalf of our respective national governments, and there was the opportunity to do more together and do it better by actually collaborating together. And so really my message here is that there isn't just a need for coordination between nation states, but also uh, coordination amongst partners, for example, at the local government level when we're working with our national partners in uh, delivering that aid. Very good, thank you. 
The lady in the back, yes. Yeah. Hi, oh, sorry. Hi, I'm uh, Vani from the Fiji Council of Social Services, and you know my thoughts are that we need, you know, for this forum to to be focused on how we mainstream the agenda of effectiveness into the next ten years of SDG implementation, and that means looking at the global level, particularly as we're looking. Uh, at the review of the high-level political forum. How do we make sure that uh, the agenda of effectiveness is um, embedded into uh, that conversation? It's a bit of a flip-flop situation in the Pacific because uh, just as the, um, you know, the, the onset of SDGs um, took place, um, the forum compact, um, which is really about pushing development effectiveness in our region, was shelved. Um, so for us, the best example right now comes from Vanuatu, where there's an aid monitoring policy and uh, there's a unit that's placed in the PM's office uh, that's working very effectively with the Vanuatu civil society. So how do we see uh, this being actioned, not just at the um, global level, but also at the national level? And that's um, echoing the, the previous sentiment. Thank you. Terrific. I think it's a, it's a theme that's come up a few times. There's a lady just across the aisle from you. Yes, please. Merci. Je suis mama. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm coming from Mali. I uh, am part of the feminist group. Uh, since yesterday, we have talked a lot about the alignment issue of uh, uh, the, the question mentioned of the empowerment of women. It is really a major challenge. Uh, to help uh, do what we are trying to do. 2030 will be pre pretty soon, but women are still poor. They are still victims of discriminations. They are still submitted to sexist, uh, sexual violence, especially in conflict areas. There are many women who are ignored and left behind. What can we do? Uh, to, to change that uh, so that the assistance could take into account this dimension of empowerment of women and fight against uh, uh, violence against women. 2030 is soon, but uh, uh, we have uh, at least 60% of women are ignored and left behind. What can we do to change that? I'm in total agreement with you. Thank you very much. And the last question now, go ahead. Laurent Sarrazin from the European Commission. I'll try to answer directly your questions on what we should do next in the next program of work. For us, the first priority is to restate the case for effectiveness by demonstrating in practice that it, by applying the development effectiveness principles, we achieve better, faster, and more sustained impact on the SDGs. We're all struggling to find more resources to address the SDGs. And we should here in this room send a message by, that by applying effectiveness principles, we can already achieve more with the resources we have. And that requires a, a bit of work to, to demonstrate it. Second, the partnership should refocus on where it can be more influential in, um, in promoting change. And that is focusing on the country level uh, working at sector, at subsector level on specific SDG challenges. Third, we should probably review the monitoring process to make it more flexible and adapt it to the country's systems and processes. That may mean that it would no longer be a biannual bi global exercise, but be carried out country by country depending on their cycles. Still, uh, a first priority would be to um, draw action plans from the findings of the 2018 report so as to use those findings to actually promote change. Thank you. Merci infiniment. Uh, so restating the principles, um, which leads me back, colleagues, uh, to our panel. Uh, and so I'm sorry to our colleague from Malawi. Uh, we'll try to find a way maybe on the margins for you to put your question to uh, the colleagues here. But as I, as I turn back um, and give you the last words, um, think about what you've heard uh, this, this morning from the room. Uh, the room has talked about knowledge sharing, 
how do we make sure that we're integrating gender equality and women's empowerment in our actions, the role of local governments, the role of effective citizen engagement, uh, the importance of civil society space in all of our actions, data as a driver for policy change and policy making, um, looking at sectoral approaches and accountability and monitoring. So as you've heard all of these various elements, how do you feel that then drives us? Which two opportunities or challenges that you've heard so far do you think needs our particular focus as we go forward? And then there were some specific questions that were put to, to some of you. Um, Robert, I'll start with you. Um, thank you, Lister. Thank you, everyone. Lots of rich uh, kind of comments. I think from uh, our perspective, well, from my perspective, a couple of key points. I, I mean, they're all very valid. I, I, I would like, um, I think this idea of localizing the SDG is absolutely fundamental, and that brings together uh, a lot of the issues here, both in terms of partnering with, um, with local governments and so forth, but taking the SDGs uh, to a more granular level with elected officials, with elected governments. And for, uh, we've already seen in the first six months of these reforms some of the very uh, some of the very talented resident coordinators using the time we have released for them to get out of the capital and spend a lot more time um, at the sort of sub-regional and municipal level engaging, uh, as someone said, the whole of society. So I do think uh, um, uh, this is going to be key for success. Um, and I think we're, how we work out uh, our partnership models for, for moving a bit closer um, the second one I would say, which I hadn't mentioned in the uh, early on, but it relates to policy, but also to analysis. Um, I think uh, a starting point for our work together has got to be a much more shared analysis between governments, between the UN, between civil society and others about uh, what it's going to take to get from here to there in the next 11 years. And uh, certainly from the UN side, these reforms are a part of this work is about investing a lot more resources in analysis and making that analysis available to a much broader cross-section of actors and opening that analysis up to a much broader cross-section of perspectives, particularly as we focus on issues like leave no one behind. We have to really hear uh, uh, from those communities and we have to recognize that unfortunately, almost by definition, the data is very poor the, uh, behind those communities because in many cases, uh, uh, yeah, we have big data gaps. So I would, I would, the second part of my reaction would be around that collaboration around analysis with data being one key part of it. Mm -hmm. And how technology in that respect can also help us address what we think are, are some of the data gaps, for instance. And Thea, what do you think? Um, I, I agree, actually, with what... Um Robert just said. Uh, I would say as well, data-driven empirical information and especially on women. Uh, just to go back to what I was saying about infrastructure, infrastructure is being designed uh, with data about the complicated logistics of women's lives or the views of the communities and stakeholders. It's being designed without that. Um, and these are the people who will use it most. Uh, and it creates an accountability and an inf information gap around large scale initiatives like the BRI. Um, importantly, uh, China recognizes this. They also recognize it's an area around community engagement that they're not familiar with. And they want that data. So in our consultations as the Asia Foundation with China, this is what we're trying. We're trying to fill that data gap. So we've talked a lot about what are the what's, you know, what is needed. And some people said how. You know, this is the critical issue. How do you do it? So how you do it in this case is how do you gather empirical evidence? At that, at that community level from women. And it requires, this is where civil society becomes really important, where local governments become really important, women's organizations, uh, because you need to go household to household. You need to talk to women. You need to gather empirical research through surveys and other quantitative and qualitative methods and produce a picture of what's going on in the community. This is something that we've been doing. Uh, we recently did two studies in Cambodia and Pakistan around BRI projects to find out you know, who's been consulted what are the impacts? And there are huge gaps in information. No one has gone that deep. And if you, and one of the amazing findings is that women were clueless. I mean, there were projects going around, bridges that were being built, roads being built that they were going to use fundamentally, and they had, they had never been consulted, not only by the investor, but most importantly, not by their local governments or organizations that were meant 
to be uh, championing those projects in their communities. So that is really critical, I think, filling that data gap, particularly on women. Yeah. And the Asia Foundation, of course, has been such, um, I think, a pioneer on polling. I remember even mm -hmm. a decade ago, we were working with you on polling in Afghanistan, for yeah. instance, it's at the enough. local, local level, which really gives you a taste for what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, Adama. Merci. Thank you. Thank you all the participants who give us the encouragement. One question was asked by my brother from the Côte d'Ivoire. Thank you. But I will give concrete cases based on my own experience. When there was the rebellion in the southern part of Senegal, just at random, I happen to be uh, the uh, um, academic inspector in the area. I'm a member of Sierra uh, ethnic group. They are close to people who receive the, the money. In uh, 1992, when there was the rebellion uh, about security, we organized consultation at the village level, and I was uh, there because they couldn't do anything against me because it was part of uh, this ethnic group. But traditional chiefs were uh, present, uh, and there were uh, co local coordinators. There were members of the uh, so uh, civil society and representative of uh, religious groups, and they have their own mythology. And it is said that if you kill a member of the Sara group, uh, your life will be miserable after that. So I was accepted, I was respected in the community to talk about the problems on the ground. And I want to mention that the Regenshof region has the highest literacy rate in Senegal, almost 100% as early as 1992. But as a result of the rebellion, the schools were closed and the teachers who were not members of the ethnic group left, uh, escaped, so there were no schools anymore. So what had to be done? Uh, what happened is at uh, I said I wanted to get young people who would go to villages to teach. I, I, I was an academic inspector, uh, so I, I decided I will not uh, get people from the north to go to work in the south. I wanted uh, teachers from the south to uh, teach other uh, young people, but they didn't have enough training. So I organized a training session for, for about uh, two weeks or a month to uh, teach them how to teach because they know, and I, sent, uh, I told them to go back to their areas because they know the local problems. They may not be the best teachers, but they know the local population. And they had to convince the young people to tell them it was important to learn. I asked for the help of religious leaders. And the second thing, lo local development plans of uh, uh, regional governments uh, in, uh, uh, take into account the problems. And that, uh, among the issues were reforestation, because it was the only part of Senegal where there are lots of trees. And re, uh, I, get, uh, I was working with a Swiss corporation um, agency, but they, they didn't know the local situation. Every year, I uh, asked five young people to go study uh, forest uh, issues, and I uh, trained them. And then I send them back to the local villages in the south to help them preserve forests. And my, uh, my colleague from the Côte d'Ivoire, the solution is it's an, uh, an indigenous solution. You have to uh, inv get the local uh, population involved, uh, religious leaders, uh, organization of the civil society to raise awareness. And after you have done that, what is the role of cooperation? Swiss and French cooperation agencies. I ask for volunteers, and I call them the education volunteers, and I send them to school, and I pay them 30,000 francs per month. And for five, it took five years, but the schools were rebuilt, and so the solution has to come from within. There is no solution that will apply the same way to all countries in the world. I like the comments. Uh, of someone who said we need an ad adaptive approach. We cannot import wholesale uh, solutions. No, you have to work with local community and work together. And I think it is very important uh, and it has to be integrated in the development plan. It's very useful. Uh, yes, it would be good 
that uh, every voice should be uh, heard, not only the voice of traditional leaders. If the last word. Gracias, Elisa. Well, thank you, Elisa. I'd like to go back to the question we were asked from uh, Mondragon in 2030. What is it that we want to say? What I would want to say is that all of us have actually, we were all able to build something together, which is key. We talk about partnerships. We talk about so many things. But when will we do this? We only have 10 years to reach that goal. And so these are the principles for effective cooperation, for sustainable development. This is what we need to do. We need to work and have priorities. And these priorities must focus towards results that uh, strategic partnerships won't just play a role, but rather work together and exercise together Ex uh, strategy priorities that are uh, consensual. This is the mechanism so that in 2030 we can all say maybe we still have some things to do, but we've done so much. And I want to specifically talk about Colombia. Colombia has 200 years of Republican and democratic history. We will be turning 200 years old. Throughout my country's development, we have moved forward and we are going to continue to build. We talked about a dialogue with different territories and the importance of talking and to have dialogue. Our government is doing that, Ivan Duque's government, when we talk about peace and uh, legality, has established direct dialogue with different territories. 170 municipalities build their own developing uh, plans with doing what we talk about bottoms up. They talked about their own needs. They were focused on their specific needs. And so our national policy, our cooperation policy is focused towards the demand on the territories, which is a multi-stakeholder exercise. And in terms of international cooperation, this has been one of the challenges in the framework that we are working on today with the United Nations. But we've worked on cooperation to, uh, according to the country's needs. And so we coordinate to benefit the parties. The biggest challenge for 2030 will be to say we were able to cooperate and work together to reach sustainable development goals. Thank you very much. Back to you. Uh, I think that uh, the room uh, deserves a, a big round of applause for the insights that they had offered on how they can drive impact. <laughs> I'd also uh, thank the colleagues on the panel for the insights that they've offered. I think we've fulfilled your uh, insight at the top, when the leg does not walk, the stomach does not eat. I think we're full. Uh, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. What an incredible conversation. Thank you so much. And what great insights from the floor. Much appreciated. In a moment, we're going straight into our closing session. But just before we do that, I just wanted to get a few remarks from Thomas Gass. Uh, so over to you, please, sir. Thank you so much. Um, when we organized this last session, we thought we need some impulses from the room, we need some impulses from the podium in order to, to continue to give energy, to move forward, to refresh the GPEDC. So I was asked as a, as a part of the incoming bureau, as a, as a future co-chair just now to, to, to listen and to, to just summarize what I've been hearing. And so it's in the spirit that you should take what I'm, what I'm going to say here right now. So, I mean, I th I'm not sure Rebecca realized that by saying that, that she actually cast the motto of the session by saying shared progress is the way forward. Huh? I think that's really what the GPDC is about. You challenged us to, to unlock bottom-up social action by involving this, continuing to involve the, the civil society, the private sector, the, the world of finance you mentioned as well. And I think by doing so, you reminded us that GPEDC is not just a set of principles, but is 
uh, is a partnership. And that's what we have to uphold. You also asked us to make uh, the implementation a local and national priority, and we had many more comments that came in that direction. Um, connecting the effectiveness agenda with the sustainable development goals, with the climate change agenda. Um, and, of course, to, that this can only be done in a multi-stakeholder fashion. Uh, you reminded us that we have some really strong instruments to do, to engage with other uh, partners, the triangular uh, cooperation, the South-South cooperation, but also the work on the nexus between development, humanitarian, and peace, uh, peace building. Then Elisa Goldberg ably uh, led this brainstorm about how to refresh uh, the GPEDC with uh, Robert uh, reminding us that, we're not the, only, that uh, the GPDC is not the only one that's looking to refresh. The UN system is also doing so. Uh, but also telling us that uh, in this eco ecosystem of development cooperation partners, we have to count with a new UN and uh, giving us a sense that uh, there, it's time to buy shares in the UNRC system. Huh? Then uh, we were reminded by, by Mrs. Mulakala, sorry for mispronouncing perhaps the name, um, that, that, we, that generally development cooperation is being driven by foreign policy. And it's not just the, the, the new, the southern providers, but it's also others that do so. So let's face that fact. Let's, let's put it on the table. Um, let's remember that... Uh, there is a risk that the GPEDC becomes the space where and becomes instrumentalized by, by these uh, internal interests. Uh, and so let's remember again what, what Rebecca Greenspan uh, just told us, shared progress is the way, the way forward. But also um, you reminded us that it's not just about making sure that the others come to our table, but that we go to the table, the, the tables that are led by the others. I think this is a really important point as we go forward. Angela uh, Ospida de Nicols, you, you reminded us of the central role of the Agenda 2030, and I think it's interesting to see how, as an agency, you, you place leaving no one behind at the center uh, in your inward and in your outward action, and, uh, and how statistics and data is the center of that. And we were reminded by the room also how important that is. And, and uh, of course, the, the working track of, on IATI of the Global Partnership on Effective Development Cooperation is a, key, uh, is a key component that we have to build upon and that we have to strengthen as we go forward. Not so that we have more data for ourselves, for better management of development cooperation, of course that's important, but also to uh, make sure that uh, an accountability to the people is, is strengthened. Um, we were reminded that if the global partnership is about co-responsibility, it's also about mutual accountability. And it's not, so these two go together when, when you are in a partnership. Uh, Merci, Monsieur Diouf, de nous... uh, thank you, Mr. Diouf, for, for reminding us that, that uh, we should put uh, back at the center of our effort uh, the, the concern uh, and the issues of the people. And, uh, and and to uh, make sure that the, uh, the 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 local government are even more involved in a direct fashion in uh, this effort. You reminded us, and it's very important that uh, it is a question of efficiency and of and effectiveness. And and you, since you're here, uh, you, you, uh, you know, and you said it, you 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 think that the concerns of the people are key, and that uh, we are all accountable to uh, the people. Uh, you've said it very well. Uh, that GPDC is a space that upholds civic space, and that should not just be for those SDGs where we rely on the NGOs to help us uh, actually deliver services, but also those where, the, where they help us to, uh, keep our feet to the fire or make sure that we actually um, are held up to high principles in our, in our cooperation. Uh, very strong 
uh, voice again, and we're taking this on board about the importance of gender equality and empowerment of women and girls as a gateway to move forward on the agenda, uh, so also as a gateway for the GPEDC to become, to become even more uh, of a mobilizer uh, internationally. And then uh, I want to just re come back to this importance of, uh, of data, which was mentioned also a number of, of times. If we want to engage local communities in a shared analysis, then we have to share data with them. And, then, and it means, and uh, you'll, you'll, you'll get to know that this is a bit of, somewhat of a peeve of mine, and that I'll be coming back to that. We're, Switzerland is hosting the World Data Forum in October 2020. And, and I believe that we, as development partners, are amassing masses of, info, of data and of information that, are, that we are using for better management of our, of our programs, for better accountability to our parliaments, etc. But we are not connecting that data sufficiently with the national statistics systems, with the people, who, with the collectivities, on the ground that actually need the data to be able to share in the analysis, to be able to hold the, the duty bearers accountable. So uh, thank you for this very rich uh, basket of, of, uh, of encouragements that we've received this morning. And back to uh, Madame Sylvia. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Thomas, for, for taking us through the highlights of the morning. Um, fantastic. We move very swiftly now to our closing session. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank the panelists as they come back to take their seats. And I want to invite our co-chairs to come up and take our, their seats on the floor. That is our outgoing co-chairs, our continuing co-chairs, and our incoming co-chairs as well. Please do come up and take your seats. And we can give them a round of applause as they do that. So as they come up, ladies and gentlemen, just to let you know that this closing session is going to take a look at contributions and actions that members can take to chart the way forward in making development cooperation more effective. That's our key word, efficiency, effectiveness. Now, there are four parts to the next session. Number one, the presentation of co-chairs' statements. Number two, the handover of co-chairs. Number three, we're going to have an expression of interest for actions, and that will be followed by the formal closing statements by the co-chairs. At this point, ladies and gentlemen, let me call the room to order, please. As we go into the next session, order in the house. Thank you. Our next speaker is His Excellency Philip Odida, Deputy Permanent Representative of Uganda to the United Nations in New York. He's going to give us a short closing statement representing Uganda as an outgoing co-chair. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Up to you. Thank you. Co Distinguished co-chairs, members of the steering committee, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, I've been asked to give these closing uh, remarks on behalf of the substantive co-chair from Uganda, the Minister of Finance, Honorable Matia Kasaija, who has been unable to attend this session. Before I do that, I thought you would allow me to just um, say in passing some reflections. Among some of the key points coming out of the deliberations of the ECOSOC in the current session and leading on to the HPLF is one, realizing the transformative uh, intent of Agenda 2030 for sustainable development requires more than just efficiencies. Second, the agenda's success requires political will to ensure that sustainable development goals truly benefit 
the marginalized and systematically excluded. Third, there is a need to re-examine our societies if indeed we are to succeed in leaving no one behind. And finally, in this context, rights-based participation that provides protected spaces for critical segments of society must be ensured across the developing world. This messaging around the call for social inclusion was heard during the opening of the HPLF as well as during the opening of our session yesterday we heard, when we heard from Amina Muhammad. And uh, speaker after speaker tends to uh, call for a renewed commitment of member states and the international community to the Sustainable Development Goals enshrined in 2030 agenda. Having said that, ladies and gentlemen, Uganda is honored to have been a co-chair of the Global Partnership for Effective Development Cooperation, together with Germany, Bangladesh, and the non-executive co-chair. It has been a long journey from when we joined the leadership of the committee, fresh from the achievements of Nairobi, to today's SLM, taking place in the wings of the HLPF. We welcome heartily the incoming co-chairs from the DRC and Switzerland. For Uganda, this occasion serves as a point of reflection of where we are in working towards implementing the sustainable development agenda. In this regard, we feel that while development cooperation has achieved much, it has yet to achieve more towards its intended objectives. This is reflected in the somber fact that while a proportion of the world's population living in, in poverty is falling, the numbers of those living at or below poverty lines remains unacceptably high. The development effectiveness agenda has contributed achievements towards better planning and implementation of economic development strategies, but it still has much more ground to cover. In this regard, we recognize that progress on various aspects of the Busan Development Effectiveness Agenda and SGDs has been uneven and sometimes slow. Progress has, from our point of view, been slow uh, in use of country systems and the extension of mutual accountability, which is key to making progress on development effectiveness. Ladies and gentlemen, it will be recalled that in Busan we agreed on the four shared principles of ownership of development priorities, focus on results, inclusive development partnerships, and transparency and accountability. These principles, further reiterated in the Nairobi outcome document and the Kampala principles we, uh, we approved yesterday, released yesterday, serve as our essential toolkit. Generally, some progress has been made on implementation. In the case of Uganda, we can report that the continuous evolution of our national development planning frameworks, we have been able to register higher quality, inclusive, and results-oriented strategies that are filtering down to the grassroots. We have enhanced multi-stakeholder efforts, uh, engagements, while recognizing that successful efforts require inclusive and equitable participation of all actors. To this end, we are in the final stages of developing a development cooperation policy that will guide on dialogue between the government, development partners, the private sector, civil society organizations, and address the challenges in the development cooperation landscape. Together with strengthening of the public financial management systems, we have, been, we have seen a strengthening in the quality and use of financial resources and greater accountability and transparency. In addition, we have developed an aid management platform 
through which reporting by development partners will be a requirement in order to feed information into our annual reports. These policy interventions have placed us in a mode in which we will be in a better position to predict at the national level the quantum of resources for forward planning and set the stage for more focused and coherent dialogue with our partners on enhancing mutual accountability systems. Over the medium term, therefore, further attention will be directed at mobilizing long-term finance in recognition of the fact that investments for sustainable development require what we see as patient capital in to facilitate inclusive growth, thereby enabling us to truly leave no one behind. Distinguished participants, these achievements lead us to believe that development assistance can be most effective when partners' countries have a way have a say in where it is most needed and on how it should be used. Countries that are accountable, that receive flexible development assistance, and that have the most ownership will be best placed to achieve positive outcomes. In this sense, I would like to point out the significance of real partnerships. As echoed in the opening segment of our deliberations yesterday, partnerships is the way to go. Through strong partnerships in which governments together with the international community and other rele relevant stakeholders working together, development effectiveness can be scaled up. We have seen this model work amongst our member countries in the steering committee, in Uganda, in Rwanda, Bangladesh, and other countries. As I draw to a close of my, my remarks, I wish to reiterate some key messaging that the steering committee in its two and a half year engagements have reflected. One is that effectiveness can be a game changer to deliver the SDGs if its values can be embedded into the transformative 2030 agenda. Secondly, that the effectiveness agenda is best viewed as an evolving process, as confirmed by the SLM and the global partnerships openness to continued adaptation to advance its principles. In conclusion, on behalf of my Minister of Finance, Planning and Economic Development, Honorable Matia Kasaija, I want to take this opportunity to thank the honorable co-chairs for their leadership and tireless efforts in steering the global partnership during the last two and a half years. I also want to thank the members of the steering committee as well as the joint support team for their excellent support over the period. Allow me to mention uh, at this point uh, call Thomas, Rebecca, Yuko, Anna, Margaret, Paloma, and Rob, and many other working behind the scenes to prepare substantive work of the global partnership. Uh, I also wish to acknowledge the hard work at the technical level uh, from the partner countries, all our colleagues, and for my part in particularly, Fred, Miriam, and Maris from Uganda who have been working, uh, preparing the substantive work. I wish to... I wish to uh, take this opportunity to welcome the incoming co-chairs, but most particularly, Uganda's successor at the African regional level. His Excellency Daniel Mosango, Secretary General, Ministry of Planning and Economic Republic of Congo, Vuzet Bienvenue, and wish the newly constituted steering committee and its members all the best. Together with Switzerland and Your Excellency Ambassador, you, you showed a short while ago the reason why you're actually coming on board as a co, as a co-chair. Um, we, together with Switzerland, as in incoming co-chairs, we count on your leadership in pursuing the development effectiveness agenda in a spirit of partnership. Within the global partnership, let us continue working together 
to make this world a better place in line with the aspirations of the 2030 Agenda and leaving no one behind. Uganda, as an outgoing co-chair, remains committed to the global partnership and we remain available to give you any support that may be needed. I thank you. Thank you very, very much for that, Ambassador Odida. Now, uh, I would like to invite Monowar Ahmed, Secretary, Ministry of Finance of Bangladesh, to present the co-chair statement on behalf of all four GPEDC co-chairs and invite the co-chairs to sign their statement. Over to you, sir. Uh, my fellow co-chairs, distinguished participants, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and good morning. It's my honor to present the co-chair statement on behalf of the GPDC's co-chairs. I would like to start by thanking fellow co-chairs for working together to prepare this statement. We would like to acknowledge that we have been immensely benefited from ideas, from uh, ideas coming from the steering committee and from the deliberations of the HLM for, the, for yesterday and this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, you are aware that this is the first HLM of its kind. Well, there is no negotiated outcome. We would like to share this statement as a reflection that will hopefully to be helpful for incoming co-chairs as they assume their leadership role in steering the partnership moving forward. Now, allow me to share a few highlights of our key takeaways. Our deliberations here have shown that effectiveness matters to all of us, and it help, helps us to deliver better results on the ground. This SLM, if you recall, those who are working with us, was proposed by our ex-honorable finance minister, Mr. A.M. Muhid, to have this HLM during these, uh, uh, along with these uh, activities of the UN. So it's happening now. So it's, in our opinion, it has been timely because we are not on track to reach the SDGs. Our deliberations here have shown that we need to not only partner more effectively, but also to focus more on those farthest behind, in line with the spirit of leaving no one behind to attain the SDGs. There is an urgency of making faster progress as one third of time has already been elapsed to implement SDGs. The inclusiveness of global partnership is our strength. The fact that everyone can join the global partnership on an equal footing enables us to respond better to the needs and priorities of our people. This is the whole of society approach envisaged by the 2030 Agenda. As co-chairs, we see the monitoring exercise of the global partnership as a unique tool. It generates evidence for the country level as well as for SDG reviews. And this is vital instrument for mutual accountability. This evidence was reasserted with the record participation of 86 partner countries in the 2018 monitoring round. This proves the value of this exercise and that we need to keep investing in it together. The monitoring will continue to adapt, guided by the countries that lead the data collection and the partners' experiences from this effort. We, the coaches, recognize the lack of progress in the unfinished businesses agenda and welcome the proposal to create a work stream to develop a global action plan for actionable areas in time for the third 
high-level meeting. New initiatives on the use of country system and untying aid should also be addressed with a sense of urgency. We remain concerned about the shrinking civic space as indicated by the monitoring evidence. We therefore call on joint actions to analyze the different constraints affecting our shared support to civil society to play its full role as development actors in their own right in achieving the SDGs. In Nairobi high-level meeting in 2016, our ambition was to bring the global partnership closer to the SDG implementation. As co-chairs, we can be proud that the past two days have marked a milestone in this regard. We can confidently say that the effectiveness works and that is a cornerstone for achieving the 2030 agenda. We have seen yesterday that living by the effectiveness principles can lead to the better development results. Distinguished participants, let me conclude with a personal reflection. The past two and a half years has been a rewarding journey for Bangladesh. The global partnership has broadened and deepened its reach, and we have achieved a significant progress. While we celebrate this as co-chairs, it is by no means our achievement alone. The global partnership is a member-led partnership. The steering committee has been instrumental in designing and delivering on our work program. Countries and partners beyond the committee have engaged actively since 2016 and also throughout our SLM deliberations. We greatly acknowledge the vital institutional support that we receive from the OECD and UNDP in delivering our responsibilities. While well, Bangladesh will proudly continue its co-chairing role, this statement closes a chapter of our leadership that we have shared with Germany and Uganda, who are stepping down. We are thankful to German, Germany and Uganda, uh, German and Uganda leaderships for their support and contributions towards achieving the development effectiveness agenda. We welcome on board both Switzerland and Democratic Republic of Congo as the new co-chairs of GPDC, along with our non-executive co-chair. I'm glad that this statement captures some of our joint achievements, and I see future holds many more promising opportunities to take the global partnership to the next level. We look forward to working closely with our fellow co-chairs from Switzerland, Democratic Republic of Congo, and non-executive co-chair to jointly steer the next chapter of the global partnership. So before finally I conclude, let me share one of my personal uh, conviction that we made commitments even for the last one and a half day. And let's promise Let's translate this commitment into actions and from actions to implement it with all the relevant stakeholders and monitor it and continue our journey. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Mr. Ahmed, for your insights, your remarks, and also for um, delivering the statement. I should say, ladies and gentlemen, that you can access the co-chair statement online. It will be available at the following um, website, www.effectivecooperation.org effectivecooperation.org. So if you want to access the statement, you can get it there. We're going into the process now of the signing. And as we do that, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about being more effective. And there's somebody clearly missing from the table if we take a look. Can someone tell me what's missing? <laughs> Women. No gender balance. So, so we challenge ourselves even as we go into the signing that...
we need to fix that. So um, we go into the signing and I'll welcome um, our team to bring forward uh, the statements that will be signed. And it is our outgoing chairs and our continuing chairs who will do the signing. Um, and that happens now, Germany. Oh dear. Is the pen working? Now it is working and Germany is signing. It is. Excellent. Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you. Followed by Uganda. Thank you very much. A round of applause for Uganda. And Bangladesh. Thank you very much. A round of applause for Bangladesh. And our non-executive co-chair now signs. Thank you. This is how we do it in Africa. In celebration. Um, ladies and gentlemen, before we move forward, can I ask all the co-chairs to please stand up so we can get some some photographs, and after the session ends, we'll take a few more, but for now, right where you are, if we could get some photos of you standing. Thank you very much. You could, I think, move a little bit closer together. DRC and Switzerland, thank you. Our incoming co-chairs, our continuing co-chairs, and our outgoing co-chairs there. Excellent. Thank you very much. You may take your seats. And now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to hand back to Thomas Gass, uh, uh, the co-chair representing Switzerland, to take over. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Juliet. And I, I think if you hadn't said it, I would have said this, <laughs> this has to be our commitment. I mean, that the next change of chairs here has to be one towards more gender balance on the, on the Bureau. So here's the first commitment of the incoming Bureau. Huh? Um, I'd, I'd like to, as I take the floor for the first time in this function, just like to uh, just uh, throw out a strong, strong kudos to the outgoing, uh, outgoing co-chair, Germany, but also Uganda. Uh, I mean, my constituency, obviously, uh, uh, Germany, you've done so much also, the, the Kampala principles, uh, broadening, this, the, broadening this community in a more formal way also, uh, um, and making sure that, that everyone has a formal voice at, the, at this table and, and not just an informal one, but also holding the whole partnership to task through a program of action. And I think those are things that we don't want to lose as we move forward. So thank you, uh, Germany. Thank you, Uganda. Thank you to their teams. I know that it's never just one person that does that. Um, and in, in terms of uh, just saying a few words on, on my own behalf, you, you've heard me just now already. For me, GPEDC needs to still get closer to Agenda 2030, but not just to the agenda itself, but also to the to the formal monitoring system of Agenda 2030. Uh, Amina Mohammed actually said it yesterday morning. She said e effectiveness is at the core of the 2030 agenda, and she expects this to be visible in September and at the HLPF. And so let's make sure that that, that really happens. Um, let's also make sure that our monitoring system, which is what, what gives strength to this partnership, uh, has a stronger uh, an effect on what we actually do. Uh, so we don't just uh, have mon monitor for monitoring sake, but we monitor so that we change the way we work. We monitor for evidence. We monitor to show that effective development cooperation actually delivers in a stronger way on the, on the ambition of, of Agenda 2030. And then uh, finally, let's, let's build on this, uh, on this variable geometry of, of multi-stakeholder uh, for us. Uh, let's engage with, with our friends uh, in, in triangular cooperation, in south-south cooperation. Let's 
talk uh, in a in a in much more open way also about the the challenges of fragility, the importance of a strong nexus. These are some of the points that uh, that I want to also put my weight behind. And, and of course, you've already heard me, and you're going to hear me again about data, because I think that's key to leaving no one behind. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, now it's my privilege to to give the to give the floor, c'est mon privilège de, de passer... It's my privilege to give the floor to uh, Mr. Daniel Mosango, who's going to be part of the Bureau, also as co-chair. Uh, Mr. Mosango, can you share with us your vision as well for this partnership? Please go ahead. Thank you, Excellency, uh, Mr. Ambassador, distinguished participants, uh, dear uh, co-host, uh, ladies and gentlemen, in your various capacities, uh, and co Excellence, Excellency, Mr. Ambassador, ladies and gentlemen, allow me, before anything else, uh, to tell you on behalf of the Democratic Republic of Congo my sincere thanks. Uh, for being uh, invited uh, to be a co-chair of the GPEDC. The Democratic Republic of Congo would like to also to express its uh, deep uh, gratitude uh, to, uh, to the uh, NEPAD, uh, to the various uh, African countries of the Central African region, uh, which have uh, supported our uh, candidacy to this uh, position during the uh, meeting of the regional uh, that uh, uh, regional meeting that was in Kampala in Uganda in uh, March uh, 2019. Uh, let me also uh, seize this opportunity to uh, uh, thank uh, warmly uh, Switzerland uh, through His Excellency Mr. Ambassador Th Thomas Gass as a co-chair with the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, uh, in your various capacities, um, you will remember that during the first uh, uh, high-level meeting of the uh, GPEDC, uh, which uh, was uh, convened in uh, 2014 in Mexico, the representative of developing country, developed countries uh, and of uh, developing countries, as well as uh, all the development actors, uh, recognized that poverty and inequalities uh, remain the uh, main challenge for us today. Based on the report uh, of resulting from the investigation that was led, uh, done in 2018, we uh, knew uh, the goals that we had to meet to uh, fulfill the uh, and uh, respect the principle of uh, our national ownership uh, to get results um, uh, uh, with inclusiveness and uh, with uh, transparency and uh, shared accountability for the uh, realization of the ODD. This important uh, monitoring exercise uh, by uh, the uh, countries and their the development partners uh, is an opportunity to measure progress made and the opportunities that need to be seized and the challenges uh, that we've met uh, to align uh, their efforts uh, with the uh, efficiency of uh, the ODA. In this vein, uh, you will remember that uh, the information and data collected and analyzed by most of the countries show the various challenges that we need to still meet, and particularly those that are linked to uh, aligning up priorities on the priorities of developing countries, the use and the strengthening of national systems, um, uh, the increase of uh, progress in the areas of transparency and accountability, the use of uh, uh, assessment of uh, 
weaknesses uh, to caliber uh, programs uh, for the countries, the uh, predictability of uh, assistance and aid at mid on the midterm horizon, the inclusion of new deals in the dialogues uh, with uh, fragile countries and the taking into account uh, of uh, greater involvement uh, uh, in the agenda 2030 and the agenda 2063 in order to meet those challenges um, we will need uh, to implement measures uh, that foster in particular a continuous dialogue and inclusive dialogue around the development results, the improvement of uh, governments and the promotion of innovative partnerships with the private sector uh, to uh, s uh, reach the uh, SDGs. The new way of working in order to strengthen synergies uh, between uh, humanitarian actors, uh, 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 development actors, and uh, in the context of uh, conflict resolution to get greater and better result, the strengthening of the statistical apparatus of country, the setting up of uh, acceleration frameworks uh, in order to uh, uh, implement the SDGs, the imp uh, improvement at the use of uh, and collect of data. Uh, in the area of development uh, through the strengthening of the capacities in this area for uh, collecting data uh, of uh, high quality and for data analysis uh, so that we can follow up on the progress and assess the impact uh, uh, on the development and the support to actions related to uh, human rights, the uh, women's rights, and to vulnerable groups. Uh, and it's true that our efforts will need to eliminate the bottlenecks uh, that have been identified through uh, concrete actions, uh, through the sharing of knowledge on the various uh, approaches uh, uh, between the north and the south, between the uh, among the north, uh, between the south, south, and on the triangular level, as well as on the regional level, the promotion of uh, f an environment of f favorable and conducive to business uh, so that uh, on the basis of an inclusive and sustainable uh, development. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, allow me to mention here that the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, as uh, other countries, uh, uh, has uh, actively contributed to the uh, uh, series of um, investigation that were led on the Global Partnership that were done in 2014, in 2016, and 2018. Um, a roadmap was uh, created and adopted uh, in 2013, and then it was updated in 2016. Um, in that same context, my country has done a three assessment of uh, fragility of weaknesses based on the five goals of cons peace uh, building and the strengthening of a new deal for fragile states. So regarding the third cycle of investigation, it was done in a political context that was uh, characterized by the organization of elections beyond the uh, constitutional timetable, the uh, political uh, uh, alternance of power and the uh, peaceful transfer of power and the results of that investigation show that the, the country has made uh, modest uh, progress and uh, with the weak contribution of partners in terms of providing data following the waiting attitude uh, related to the political context. So to illustrate this, uh, you know, the quality of the uh, dialogue between the public sector and the Public sector has been uh, assessed to be efficient, uh, uh, even though the uh, uh, the context for uh, social society is uh, characterized as basic. Uh, regarding uh, accessibility of uh, transparent information regarding cooperation for development, um, they uh, show a remarkable score of 98 uh, percent. The strengthening of uh, the uh, framework for re national results uh, is at 70 percent, even though the quality of the dialogue between the public and the private sector is uh, assessed to be efficient for the government and the trade unions on the one hand, and uh, 
and it's undergoing, uh, you know, strengthening for the private sector. Um, regarding uh, mutual accountability for development actors, uh, um, it is not at all strengthened uh, as long as the uh, uh, gender equality remains a big challenge. Uh, in conclusion, um, I would like to uh, underscore that the Democratic Republic of Congo shares fully the idea according to which uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, implementation of the Agenda 2030 requires uh, additional efforts uh, and urgent action. It is in that context that my country is committed with the support of its partner, including UNDP, uh, to prioritize and localize the SDGs uh, uh, and well define its national measures uh, according to the 38 targets that have been prioritized and uh, supported by 58 indicators. The, uh, ex that exercise has been expanded uh, after that through the production of uh, mapping of the uh, map indicators, uh, including referential values as well as annual targets for the next five years. Uh, our uh, national uh, national plan for strategic development uh, for 2019 to 2023 is being. Um, approve as we speak and uh, and will support mostly uh, uh, the uh, access that have to do with the SDGs. Uh, this is why we plead in favor of uh, an involvement of all so that we can set up a, a, a framework that will allow to accelerate the implementation of SDGs through uh, uh, the implementation of national and regional plans uh, and also uh, have the signing of a collective framework for accountability that will foster a more efficient partnership guaranteeing a greater transparency Parents, yeah, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General uh, Mosango. Uh, I have a number of changes in the steering committee. Um, you, uh, we, will, we will welcome the Ivory Coast, nominated by the African countries. <laughs> Bienvenue. Um, Welcome. Waiting for a second nomination, a third nomination, because we, we already we also have the DRC, a third nomination from the Africa uh, group. Then we welcome Colombia, uh, replacing Mexico, and a big thanks also to, to the Mexican team for all the energy you've put into the GPDC. Big welcome, warm welcome to Colombia. Then uh, we welcome, should I say again, Korea <laughs> to come uh, and, and take the, the group, take forward the group uh, on behalf of Japan also. And a big thanks to Japan. Um, we welcome the Inter-American Development Bank replacing the World Bank in the, uh, in the Multilateral Development Bank group. Uh, welcome <laughs> to ODB over there. Um, Germany will stay on as ex officio member of the steering committee. We thank you for doing that and for continuing to bring your energy to the, to the group. Huh? Thank you. <laughs> and, and we'd like to give a special thanks also to the Aga, Found, uh, Aga Khan Foundation that is leaving uh, the steering committee. And we're waiting for another foundation to replace uh, the Aga Khan Foundation as representative of the foundations. So thank you, Aga Khan Foundation. I don't know where you are. <laughs> thank you. Um, now I have the honor to give the floor to a number of uh, steering committee members and, and, uh, and, and representatives of constituencies for very specific commitments and engagements that they promised to to contribute moving forward uh, for short statements. Um, so we will start uh, 
with the Deputy Assistant Minister, His Excellency Susumu Kuwahara, uh, International Cooperation Bureau in the Japanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs, to take the floor and highlight the linkages the global partnership could make to the work of the G20 on development cooperation. Um, Mr. Kuwahara? Oh, there you are. Okay. Thank you. And first of all, Japan would like to express our appreciation for this fruitful and insightful discussion we have had during these two days. Japan, as a member of the steering committee from August 2015 to July 2019, is extremely honored to be able to witness and contribute to several significant achievements of this very unique multi-stakeholder partnership. Now, um, by way of informing global follow-up and as the presidency of G20, Japan would like to share the G20's contribution to development effectiveness, in particular the Osaka update on the G20 action plan on the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which Development Working Group updates each year. This document underscores the G20's collective and concrete action toward the implementation of the 20th Agenda to ensure no one is left behind, <coughs> in which the priority areas include health and education, quality infrastructure, innovation, gender equality, climate change, and marine environment. The annex of the Osaka update shows the outcome of the second round of the voluntary peer learning mechanism where awareness, ownership, and engagement are featured as one of the G20's policy and institutional challenges. Furthermore, as emphasized in the G20 initiative on human capital investment endorsed in Osaka, the G20 supports equal access to quality education based on evidence by proving the availability and the following up of inclusive, accessible, quality, timely evaluations and measurements in order to address the learning crisis. Following the 2019 G20 summit held two weeks ago in Osaka, we are going to present the G20's collective actions in support of implementation of the 2030 Agenda as a global framework at the HLPF in New York. It is meaningful that the discussions at the G20 and the GPDC are linked and reflected each other in order to promote effectiveness agenda at all levels towards achieving the 2030 agenda. Japan would like to call for collective efforts from our fellow G20 members here participating to the SLM to continuously support the effectiveness agenda within the arena of the G20. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhara, and thank you, Japan, for holding up the effectiveness agenda so strongly. Um, next, I have on my list um, Madam Hyun Jo Oh, Director General of Development Cooperation Bureau at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Republic of Korea, to highlight her vision for the road ahead for the global partnership and how the Republic uh, of Korea will support it. Madam Oh, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair, and uh, distinguished participants. It, is, it was truly a meaningful and constructive weekend. <laughs> the discussions we have had for the past one and a half days was an occasion to generate a great deal of political momentum for the future of the GPDC and to reconfirm the validity of the GPDC as a platform for all stakeholders for the development cooperation. On this achievement, I would like to thank the outgoing uh, co-chairs for their leadership and all e uh, efforts exerted. And I would like to congratulate incoming co-chairs on the assumption of an important role they will take. And we will render our full support for their work. As the host country of the uh, fourth high-level forum on aid effectiveness held in Busan, in 2011, Korea has placed a great importance and weight on furthering, uh, further advancing the key principles of the GPDC. 
Reconfirming its commitment to the GPDC, Korea will join the steering committee again from August this year. And we look forward to working closely with other Asian member states to bring about, to bring about meaningful results. During the discussions we have had over the weekend, I think we confirmed that it is high time for the GPDC to translate the Pusan principles into tangible achievements. I believe there are three tasks that the GPDC need to tackle to realize this. First, to better contribute to the SDGs, we can bring in the main topics of discussion of the SDGs and develop the discussions into relevant norms and guidelines through the multi-stakeholder process of the GPDC. And we can utilize our monitoring system as a tool to check implementation of norms and guidelines. Second, the GPDs should be equipped with the statistical tools and sufficient data to keep track of implementation. In this regard, Korea hopes for greater input and contributions by the joint support team as well as donor countries. Moreover, support for this uh, statistical capacity of recipient countries should be strengthened. This will allow for better collection and management of domestic data required for a most, more accurate assessment of development effectiveness on the ground. Third, the representativeness and effectiveness of a steering committee needs to be further strengthened. The greatest merit of the GPDC is its optimum composition. It is not an exclusive forum among advanced donor countries. And it is an uh, open platform where not only nation states, but a whole range of other actors, such as international organizations, civil society, take part on an equal footing. Korea believes this ideal format is conducive to generating concrete results. And yet, there is still room for further improvement. The steering committee can be more practical and efficient when each member strengthens its communication with its constituent uh, members. The GPDs should not be complacent with its status of a symbolic multi-stakeholder forum. It should move beyond a set of principles to action-oriented framework that can yield achievements in line with the implementation of the Agenda 2030. For this, Korea have played and will play a meaningful role in its endeavors. As part of these efforts, Korea has been hosting the Busan Global Partnership Forum annually to, uh, since 2014 and biannually since 2017. And the fifth Busan Forum will be held on December 4th to 5th this year in Seoul. And taking this opportunity, Korea plans to foster close links between the Busan Forum and GPDC 2019 to 2020 program of work, which is to be adopted at the steering committee later this year. Korea very much hopes to have the pleasure of um, welcoming you all in, in Korea. Formal invitations will be sent out in September via diplomatic channels and through individual uh, contacts. So thank you again, and I hope to see you all in Seoul in December. Thank you, Madam O. Thank you for the invite. And uh, I know that within the steering committee, there are already discussions to see whether we can hold the steering committee meeting close to that, to that meeting uh, in Busan. Um, I, I have on my list uh, uh, Colombia, uh, Madame Angela Ospina de Nicoles. Can I give you the floor again? Embajador to the, their ambassador Thomas Gas once again thank you very much to Mexico's delegation thank you very much for uh, giving us your uh, post we're willing to work and hope to uh, work towards uh, the same guidelines that you've uh, set for us it's an honor for Colombia to receive the nomination to become part of the steering co mission, committee of the GPEDC and APC Colombia reiterates its commitment and constant work to uh, achieve the goals of this uh, partnership. Those who spoke before me 
gave us specific guidelines as to what they will do. So we will join these purposes, especially so that cooperation is efficient. The Global South has a big responsibility, but we have a lot to contribute. This is part of the commitment we like to bring to this committee. Finally, we've mentioned often the uh, collection of, informa the, of data information. This isn't just about accountability, but it's also about monitoring. What are we doing? How are we doing? What do we need to do? And where will we go from now on? Thank you very much. Thank you very much and welcome to this uh, strong leaders, uh, uh, strong women leaders. Welcome. Next on my list, the, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Sri Krishna Nepal, Joint Secretary, Minister of Ministry of Finance of Nepal, asking him to speak uh, on how, what kind of actions partner countries would like to take and uh, going forward within the GPDC. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Nepal. Thank you, Chair. First of all, I would like to extend uh, the congratulations to you for being appointed uh, as a co-chair of GPDC. It has been really a very fruitful weekend. Uh, uh, the focus discussions uh, of one and a half days, it has really re-justified the relevancy of GPEDC mechanism. Uh, Co-chairs of the GPEDC, distinguished colleagues, all protocols observed. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in this closing session. In our capacity as GPEDC steering committee member, Nepal together with Bangladesh held a side event on Friday. Taking stock of effectiveness principles at country level, allow me to share some of the actions from those discussions. First, for LDCs and other recipient countries, the quality of aid always matters. There is still more to do in using country systems, which reinforces ownership. The original commitments are very important and have real implications on the ground. Governments should continue to strengthen country systems. At the same time, development partners should rely on these systems and demonstrate that they are walking the talk. Second, the development cooperation land landscape in, in partner countries is changing rapidly. Countries are blessed by choices, but are also challenged to manage an increasingly complex development finance and cooperation landscape. While we must not lose focus on the original commitments, the GPDC also must evolve so that the effectiveness principles can be embedded in modalities beyond ODA. Third, speakers at our events endorsed the importance of a whole of society approach and the engagement of all development actors. We understand that more needs to be done at country level to create an enabling environment and efforts are already underway in this regard. GPEDC must continue as a knowledge platform on how all actors can collaborate effectively. Fourth, speakers at our side event strongly validated the value of the Global Partnership Monitoring Survey as a source of evidence, as a way to gather evidence at country level, and as a basis for dialogue. But we must do more to ensure complete and reliable reporting and that the results are translated into action, potentially by using monitoring results to establish clear targets and action plans to be implemented maintained between monitoring cycles. Fifth and final, at the country level, the effectiveness principles remain very relevant. They have been localized and embedded into national policies, institutional mechanisms, and core development processes. There is most, much experience to be shared. GPDC must continue as a platform for knowledge sharing on the, how the principles are being translated into action at the country level. To conclude, Nepal remains committed to work on effectiveness principles, being part of global partnership for effective developments. Thank you once again for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Nepal. 
Next, I would like to give the floor to Ms. Beverly Longid of the Civil Society Partnership for Development Effectiveness to share perspectives of non-executive stakeholders. What are the actions you will deliver going forward? Your Excellencies, uh, co-chairs, and members of the Global Partnership, distinguished participants to the senior level meeting, good afternoon. In behalf of the Civil Society Organization Partnership for Development Effectiveness, or CPDE, we would like to praise the efforts to hold a senior level meeting of the GPEDC back to back the HLPF. We sincerely thank those that have worked hard for this to happen and all the delegates who have traveled far to contribute to the SLM. I think, we think, by our participation, we have reaffirmed the importance of this community. Uh, by our participation, we have reaffirmed the importance of the global partnership. We see this meeting as a key milestone towards the celebration of the Busan Agreement that will take place in two years' time. From this meeting, we take away the conviction that the deliberations endorsed together in 2011 were visionary and forward and were forward looking. Our conversations here in New York, inside and outside the hall, have just confirmed that without transparency, without country leadership, and without people's participation on development processes, the ambitions of the 2030 agenda will not be met. With this reality in mind, the civil society organization community will continue to fully support the endeavors of the global partnership and will outreach to other platforms to share the lessons and the opportunity coming from the effectiveness agenda. Bearing in mind that everybody should be leaving, leading by improving their own record on effectiveness, we highlight at least three areas where the expertise and knowledge are readily available. One, we would like to call on the development partners to deliver on the realization of the CSO enabling environment commitments. It is in fact possible to initiate a multi-stakeholder work stream to implement country level initiatives to realize the Nairobi commitment on reversing shrinking space and closing civic space. In this regard, we invite all GPEDC constituencies to commit to the Belgrade call to action on reversing shrinking civic spaces, including the protection of human rights defenders. <laughs> Two, adopting the monitoring framework for the fourth monitoring round to countries facing conditions of conflict and or fragility and South-South cooperation by safeguarding the integrity of the monitoring framework endorsed in Busan. Three, last, building upon the Kampala principles to develop a monitoring indicator for the effective private engagement in development cooperation, including an assessment of blended finance and other leveraging arrangements consistent with development effectiveness principles labor and other international human rights standards, these principles should contribute to putting people at the center of effective development cooperation. We join the others that have previously made this commitment to transform our commitments to action. If governments can aim to leave no one behind, then it should not be difficult for all of us to pledge to leave no commitment behind. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. And uh, <laughs> we wait to be rocked. We, we're ready to be rocked. Um, I still have two statements uh, uh, from the floor here, and then I'd like to uh, pass it back to uh, our very able MC. Um, first, and a short statement first from Mr. Mocheldin on behalf of the World Bank Group is uh, coming in. And thank you for being with us also for these two days and engaging strongly with this partnership. All right, thank you so much, Ambassador Gash. Always um, great for the World Bank Group to be part of uh, very useful um, and effective initiatives to help us achieving the ambitious goals of sustainable development. So on behalf of the World Bank Group, and given that we are going to be passing the uh, baton to um, our colleagues in the IDBs, let's say on behalf of the MDBs as well, who have been uh, working hard and effectively with our team, uh, let me uh, name them, the African Development Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the Caribbean Development Bank, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the IDB Group, uh, IFAD, Islamic Development Bank, and ourselves we are very grateful for the opportunity to serve and support the work. Um, we are happy that the work that we have been doing since the very beginning is completely in line with the Addis Ababa Action Agenda. As you know, the MDBs are committed to scaling up financing for development uh, to achieve the SDGs based on these uh, principles. Uh, worked hard together, not just uh, since 2015, but even um, a couple of years before that, we started the collaboration to get ourselves into a uh, full aligned uh, manner to achieve the SDGs at the country uh, level. Happy as well that the Kampala principles, the five principles, are consistent with how the MDBs have been collectively pursuing the partnerships and uh, based on that, um, we're happy to uh, emphasize that we will continue to play a critical role in supporting the efforts of uh, the member countries to translate the SDGs into uh, practical country level operations. Uh, specifically, uh, we are committed to stepping up our efforts to better utilize the uh, respective business models in the field uh, to boost the multiplier effect of financing, to increase technical assistance, especially in the areas related to data. And uh, unfortunately, and it's good that you are hosting the data forum uh, uh, next year in Switzerland to have an assessment of the efforts towards getting uh, better data. But unfortunately, so far, we didn't achieve what we wish to see um, of better indicators for um, uh, development that to help us monitoring and improving governance and accountability. So I hope that the collaboration will be better in the future. And to ensure that knowledge is shared and to provide innovative solutions to multidimensional development um, um, uh, uh, progress. Now, I'm, I'm happy as well to share this uh, uh, pamphlet which is available um, in the room, um, which have been um, collectively prepared by specific examples of different areas um, of work, including in areas related to climate change, energy, financial inclusion, gender equality, infrastructure and industrial development, services, small and medium-sized enterprises, and of course, supporting jobs, jobs and jobs wherever and whenever we can. This is a very pressing need um, for us. Having said that, we'll continue uh, our support uh, to uh, the MDB's group and to the new fantastic uh, team leading the work for better coordination and for better effectiveness um, uh, of development going forward. And as I mentioned yesterday, if uh, it doesn't exist in the budget, it doesn't exist, period. So I'm happy to tell my team working in this that the budget items supporting their engagement is still very much there and will continue as we started with full commitment. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And now I'd like to give the floor to Susanna Mohed. 
She's been at the helm of DAC for a short time, but already has put so much energy and, and is really holding up the development effectiveness uh, agenda. And thank you also for being here the, these two days. Um, you have the floor for some final words from your side. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very struck that we're at precisely the midpoint between Busan and 2030. And I think, as uh, Freddie Mercury would have said, don't stop me now. Uh, it's, it's easy, and I would argue lazy, to say that development effectiveness is past its sell-by date and that we need to move on to other things. I think our thinking needs to be refreshed. But development effectiveness, and indeed the GPEDC, is a global public good and we need to protect and preserve and modernize it. And development ineffectiveness is a global public bad. But we can't afford to stand still. Time is marching on, and the next phase of development effectiveness must grip today's challenges if we are going to deliver the SDGs. There are more players, Development is more complex, there's more fragility, there's less mutual accountability, and climate change is layered on top of this, to name but a few of the challenges. And we don't have enough resources, and that is why we need development effectiveness. Now, ODA will remain critical, but it will never be enough. We need to have a much larger pie, and I would argue, change the recipe. We need more private sector finance, more blended finance, more innovation, more risk, more learning, more appetite for change. So what will the DAC do to contribute to this? First of all, we will champion modernization of development effectiveness, beginning by implementing the Kampala principles, but also by continuing to expand our dialogue with civil society organizations and others. We're going to strengthen and diversify our partnerships with those countries in receipt of official development assistance, with other donors, the Indias, the Chinas, Latin American partners, with civil society organizations across the world, and with the private sector, local and global. Thirdly, we're going to monitor and hold our DAC members to account and strive to, pr to promote mutual accountability. We cannot do this on our own. Fourthly, we'll redouble our efforts to focus on impact and results. And when we're not getting it right, on the basis of evidence, we will change direction and what we do. Fifthly, I commit to keeping development effectiveness central to the DAC's work to make it revitalized and relevant to 2019 and the years ahead. And lastly, but by no means least, we will never forget that development effectiveness is for the poorest of the world and particularly for women and girls, because they indeed are the champions. Thank you. Thank you, Susanna Moorhead. And I'm now going to give the mic back to, to our MC, but first I'd like, I'd like you all to, to really give her a round of applause because uh, she has been a wonderful and she has given energy to this room. And uh, she has connected with our substance here, which is not always the case for moderators. Well, well done. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. It has been a pleasure and an honor to, to be with you all over these past uh, one and a half days. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our final speaker for the day, who's going to give us closing remarks. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable Parliamentary State Secretary Norbert Bartel of Germany. A warm round of applause as he comes up, please. Thank you. Oh, from there? Thank you. So, thank you, truly. Excellencies, <coughs> Excellencies, fellow co-chairs and steering committee members, ladies and gentlemen, now we are concluding the first senior level meeting of the Global Partnership. We made a point of combining the completion of our joint work program with the United Nations High-Level Political Forum. And I think this is a very important signal because the effectiveness debate is really about the same issue as the HLPF. 
making development policy more effective for people and creating more efficiency in our fight against poverty, hunger and climate change. Over the last two days, we have focused on progress and challenges with regard to implementing the effectiveness principles. Our SLM was a real peer learning event, a dialogue with all stakeholders across regions and sectors. And I'm convinced that we will all go home with many new insights on how we can further improve our cooperation and how we can make development for all more effective and sustainable. And ladies and gentlemen, now that the senior level meeting and our joint work program are drawing to a close, and my time as a co-chair of the Global Partnership is also nearing its end, I would like to sincerely thank my colleagues, the co-chairs from Bangladesh and Uganda, and from Reality of Aid Africa. And I want to thank the members of the steering committee and of the joint support team for our excellent cooperation. And on a more personal note, I would like to thank my German team, Martina Metz and uh, Udo Weber, for their untiring work over the last 30 months, their support, their incredible commitment, and their readiness to always go the proverbial extra mile have contributed a lot to the success story we have written over these two and a half years. I am sure that the new co-chairs and the new members of the steering committee, together with those who are continuing their work in the next phase, will provide very active and constructive support and inspiring input to the future work of the Global Partnership. Looking back, we find that we have made substantial progress together, thanks to our good cooperation in the working groups for the implementation of the strategic priorities in the work program, we were able to achieve important milestones for the Global Partnership. Our joint co-chair statement has outlined these achievements. The work of the past few years have shown that realizing the effectiveness agenda is a key element for sustainable global development. The question of how we can implement development processes in a results-oriented way and with the greatest possible effectiveness is crucial for the success of these processes. Let me underline one thing again. We can only reach our global goals through the joint efforts of all stakeholders. So it's a great achievement for our work and for the global partnership to have a non-governmental co-chair to strengthen the co-chair level. As a co-chair, we have also worked for more engagement with the private sector. One visible result of our intensive and constructive dialogue with business representatives, unions, governments, and civil society has been the establishment of the Business Leaders Caucus and the adoption of the Kampala principles for effective cooperation with the private sector. For Germany, it's also, it also has been especially important to gain specific insights into the preconditions and challenges for effective cooperation in practice on country level. We have put these insights in a global compendium of good practices. Yesterday and today, we looked at what we have achieved, but also at the future course of the global partnership. The findings of the latest monitoring effort, but also our dialogue as, at the SLM, have shown that we are still facing great challenges despite all our achievements, both with regard to implementation and with regard to the inclusion of all stakeholders that are important for development processes. We must keep adjusting our responses to current challenges at the national and global levels. Excellencies, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, 
The effectiveness principles that we agreed in Busan are still as important as they were then. Even in fast-moving times, we must not neglect the questions of how to design our cooperation and how to ensure good quality of our cooperation. Otherwise, we would be wasting resources that are urgently needed. Together, we have a responsibility to keep our good and constructive cooperation alive and to take our successes further. In this spirit, Germany will continue to actively support the global partnership. Now, it is a special moment for me to say farewell to you as the co-chair for the group of DAC countries. My very best wishes to my successor, Ambassador Thomas Gass, and to the whole co-chair team. All the best to all of you for your future work. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very, very much. As we close, ladies and gentlemen, another warm round of applause for all the co-chairs, outgoing, continuing, and the incoming. Thank you. A very big thank you to OECD and UNDP for supporting this meeting. Can we give them a round of applause, please? And to each of us in the room, whatever constituency you represent, whatever institution you come from, we need to leave here keeping in mind that we have a responsibility. We carry a burden on our shoulders. We must keep the promises that we have made. We must carry the message back home to our countries. We must look to participate and to partner effectively. We must act. And this is a responsibility we have to really transform the lives of the most vulnerable. There was an old saying that told us you learn how to cut a tree by cutting a tree, but I don't like to share that anymore because we don't want to cut trees. So ladies and gentlemen, you learn how to plant a tree by planting a tree. Please go plant. My final word is that all the messages we have shared will go in and efficiently be spread across the high-level political forum. So they will be discussed at length. And so I want you to take that knowledge with you, even as we go away to enjoy a Sunday afternoon in New York City. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. All the best. Thank you. Thank you.